mentors are the program. Uh, it's, it's just, that is that you guys are the program. So thank you so much for, again, living through these crazy times and still giving you know, freely of yourselves, of your resources, of your expertise to the students. And, and I hope that you will continue uh, to build that relationship for many of the students. You are likely their first professional mentor. And if any, any theme came out of our lecture series this year, it's that mentorship is so important to everyone who's gotten to the place where they are. So again, thank you mentors so much for all that you've done. Uh, I also wanna thank uh, both the, the administration and directors at the Cancer Center and specifically because most folks on this call are in my department, Department of Biomedical Informatics. I'd like to thank the leadership of the department. It's Mike Besich, my boss, the chair of the department is incredibly supportive of this program and is again, the only reason why uh, I'm able to spend time uh, to be able to do it. So thanks to Mike and to Harry Hawkeiser, who's our training program director for encouraging mentors uh, to work with high school students, uh, which doesn't happen in a lot of departments. So I'm incredibly blessed, not only to have colleagues like you who are willing to give of your time, but to have people who running the, the programs that we're in to encourage it when that's not always the case. So thanks to them. Thanks to Rich Boyce, who's not here, but for really pioneering our program for the students, the deaf and hard of hearing, and really driving that and making it bigger every year. Uh, for our mentors outside of the University of Pittsburgh at Gallaudet for the first time ever, I think thanks to Tugba and Debo for their work this summer. I, I appreciate it, and, and I know the students do too. So thanks to all of you, all the members, to everyone else who helped to put this on, the teams, the, the people who have done lectures, who have worked in administration behind the scenes to make sure everything that works. Solomon, of course, who, who does everything for the program. And again, I'll thank him much more later. Uh, so thanks to everyone. And finally, thanks to all of you for coming today, um, for the families of, of students, for supporting the students through this program this year and giving them uh, to us for a little bit of time. So I really appreciate that. And so now we're going to get started. The way that it will work today is, and I will drop the schedule into the chat for those of you who don't have them or don't have it. Um, but essentially we're gonna have three sessions. They will all start on time. So we have a session that's starting now at 9.10 and Ohm will start in one second. Um, and we will do five speakers. For each speaker, I will just say who the speaker is and the mentor, and then the mentor who's going to introduce the student, I ask for you to unmute, introduce the student, student, then you'll be able to share your screen and just do your talk. Uh, the talk should be about 10 minutes, and then we'll hold a minute or two uh, for questions afterwards, okay? Uh, at the end of each break, we, or at the end of each section session, we will take a break until the start of the second one. So we will run on time. In my experience, these talks run a little bit fast. So if we finish at 10.10, we will still take a break to 10.40 so that the second group of speakers is on time, okay? So with that, I wanna thank all of you again. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to, to Om, who was mentored oh, with mentor. by Murat, Bushra, and Nathan this <laughs> summer. So I don't know if Bushra and Nathan okay. are gonna- Yeah, introduce yeah, I'll give a quick introduction. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Nate Reek. I'm a grad student at Pitt, and I work in a biosignal processing lab with Dr. Murat. Our research focuses on EEG and brain-computer interface research. This summer, we were fortunate to have Ohm working in our lab with us. Um, Ohm is going into his senior high, year of high school at Montour High School, and he is considering studying computer science in college. Over the summer, Ohm was involved in um, a research project that uh, focused on um, EEG for kids with autism. Um, this study primarily focused on identifying distress and non-distress states from brain activity in order to help with emotion regulation. So now I wanna turn things over to Ohm so he can give a more, um, a higher level description of what he did this summer. Thank you, Nate. So oh, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see it? All right. 
My project was classification of distress versus non-distress with EEG-based BCI in individuals with ASD. Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, is a neurological development disability that affects learning, social interaction, and behavior. These neurological differences impact emotional functioning and emotional regulation, or ER. This may cause them to react negatively to emotional stimuli with temporary outbursts, aggression, and self-injury. Using neurofeedback technology can provide an evaluation and intervention tool without the need for verbal or physical response, which removes participant bias. To achieve this, an EEG-based brain-computer interface, or BCI, could be used to improve emotional regulation. Our goal was to develop a classifier to efficiently differentiate between distress and non-distress using EEG data. In this study, there were 25 participants with autism spectrum disorder. It was a compilation of both the data sets from the University of Pittsburgh and the University of Alabama. Each of them had electroencephalograms or EEG data collected, which measures the electrical activity of the brain, and then it measured in microvolts, and it was collected during the effective positive task. And the figure on the bottom right shows the placement of the electric channels for the EEG data collection. Spark 25 subjects played a computer card game based on the effective positive task. It consisted of 100 trials, and on the figure to the right, um, there are three possible outcomes at the bottom, correct, wrong, and too slow. The first task included only correct and wrong responses, but the second task also included the too slow response. Both had no EG data collection, but the third task introduced deception by replacing a too slow in place of 60% of the correct responses and did have EG data collection. This frustration causes distress, which is classified as lose, whereas the non distress trials are classified as win. Once the data was collected, it was cleaned. An FIR bandpass filter with a cutoff frequency of one in 30 hertz was applied. Afterwards, multiple irregularities were removed, such as electro channels with high frequency noise, loose connections that caused no data to be collected for more than five seconds, or low correlation with other nearby channels. The figure at the bottom shows an example where blue data is the data that's kept and red is removed. EEG artifacts, which are signals recorded by the EEG but not necessarily generated by the brain, they were then removed using artifact substrates reconstruction, ASR. This is done by learning statistical properties of clean calibration data and then comparing it with statistics of new data to reconstruct a signal where the artifact is removed from the data. Bad periods are also rejected if amplitudes are outside of certain standard deviation. Independent component analysis, or ICA, breaks down the EEG signal into a set of components representing different sources, such as the brain, eye, or muscle. The figure at the bottom right shows the components of the EEG signal and their relative percentages to the original signal. The, the signal was then re-referenced to the A1 and A2 channels, which were the grounds located on the earlobes, and this allowed the PZ channel to be used for data instead of as the reference for the other channels. It also allowed the two data sets from the University of Pittsburgh and the University of Alabama to have the same reference channel. EEG epicking was used to extract sections from the continuous EEG signal into the various trials. And lastly, a baseline correction of 200 milliseconds before the stimuli was used to correct activity post stimuli. Once the data was cleaned, feature extraction was used to obtain spectral and temporal features. These were taken at 400 milliseconds, one second, and three seconds after stimuli. Spectral features were based on the frequency domain and used Welch's method or Welch's periodogram of spectral density estimation to calculate the theta power from 3 to 8 hertz, the beta power from 3 to 13 hertz, or 13 to 30 hertz, and mu power 7 to 12 hertz, and total power from 3 to 30 hertz for both averages and totals. The other three features were also calculated using frontal channels. Using F3 and F4, the absolute power difference was calculated and using F3, FC, and F4, the total power and average power calculated. 
temporal features are based on the time domain and included the P300, which is a positive change in the EEG data at 300 milliseconds and at an expected peak in the EEG data. It also included averages of non-overlapping intervals of 100 milliseconds. Feature selection was then implemented on the extracted features to determine which subset of features results in the most accurate classification of the data. The algorithm was weighted sequential forward selection, and it works by iterating through each feature sequentially and then passing, the, passing it to a function to evaluate criterion and evaluate each candidate and adds it to the feature subset if it improves classifier accuracy. And this process continues until adding more features doesn't affect the accuracy of classifier. Selected features were normalized using zero mean normalization. And the result is that every feature has zero mean and univariance, giving each feature the same significance in a classifier. And using tenfold stratified cross validation, the features are used to train and test a support vector machine or SVM classifier on its ability to correctly predict distress versus non distress conditions. The regression algorithm used for the classifier was polynomial model with order two. And as shown in the image on the right, the support vector machine works by finding a hyperplane that maximizes the margin distance between the two classes relative to their closest points called support vectors. Classifier had an overall accuracy of 86.5%, sensitivity of 83%, and specificity of 88.7%. Sensitivity can also represent the win accuracy, while the specificity represents the lose. In summary, we developed an EEG-based BCI system based on the effective Posner task to analyze the effect of distress on the brain. We also determined that EEG-based BCI can successfully differentiate distress and non-distress conditions. And our results suggest that this technology can complement clinical interventions, which can be used to improve emotional regulation. In the future, this can be used to implement a real-time BCI that could distinguish between distress and non-distress. We'll also investigate specific EEG features that can help identify changes in emotional stress. So many thanks to my PI mentors, Dr. Murat, Kakaya, Nathan Reek, and Bhusha Susan for all their help and guidance during the project, as well as Dr. David Boone, Solomon Lifshitz, University of Pittsburgh, the University Hillman Cancer Center Academy, and the Department of Biomedical Informatics. Thank you. Good job, Om. Um, and I will ask again, if we're all in person, we can give applause. Uh, so I'm gonna ask for everyone to unmute after every talk and just give a quick round of applause. Great work, Om. Um. Nice job, Om. Um. Any questions for Om? Um? So, so Om, I'll ask a question. So this is pretty impressive results uh, for your classifier. Are you concerned at all with overfitting? And if so, how would you test to see if overfitting is happening? So I did try polynomial order three and I feel like that was overfitting because it was picking out too many things with uh, bias. And so that's why I went with polynomial order two. I'm not totally sure how to test that, but I mean, the results can show that from just using cross-validation because it doesn't have those points. Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, if you could ever have an independent data set, which is basically impossible, I think for, for a lot of things that the lab is doing, uh, that's a really easy way to test for overfitting, right? So it does it, um, do, if you had a completely naive data set gathered from somewhere else would these results still hold up, but that's, you know, a tall order to ask for any classifier to have that type of data. But really nice job. Any other questions? If not, that's okay. Uh, great job, Om. Um, uh, congratulations. Our next speaker will be Rachel, mentored by Sophia. So Sophia, do you want to introduce Hi. Rachel? Nice to see you all. So yeah, uh, it's my pleasure to present right on Saka. She's a junior at the St. Francis de Salle High School. She's very good with programming and she loves electronics. Um, 
And she, she really, I, I was really impressed with how fast she was in picking up a new programming language and doing the data analysis for this project which ha that has to do with uh, predicting the outcomes of uh, patients with chronic pain conditions. Okay, I will share my screen. Wait, hold on. It says I have to let my computer have the. Okay, give me a second. <laughs> no problem. Okay, now it says I have to. I have to quit Zoom and come back before. It, let me share my screen. Okay. I, I've been there before, Rachel. Don't worry yeah. about it. Go ahead and quit Zoom and come back on. Okay. We'll see you in a minute. So this is a common problem on Macs, I think, especially after updates, it seems to want to default back to this. Okay. So if we were all together, this would be a nice time to go grab another cup of coffee. Okay, I'm back now. Okay, it should work. There it is. Okay, great. Okay, so hi, my name is Rachel Saka, and my project was on predicting the pain improvement of chronic pain patients using machine learning. So for our background info, so many chronic pain patients go on trips to doctors and are prescribed pain medication that proved to be of little to no use. And what if there's a way to predict patient to use patient info to predict whether or not a patient would improve or not. In our project, we hope to come up with a solution to this problem. So using a data set of 8,000 patients, we analyzed and used these insights to create machine learning models to predict patients' outcome. In order to build the data set, a survey of patients was conducted. Each patient was asked questions that allowed us to group them into demographics. For example, the data set has information about each patient's age, whether they're married or not, and previous drug or alcohol use, as well as a baseline telling the amount of pain the patient reported on their first doctor's visit on a scale from one to 10. So when the patient came back a few months later, another survey was done to see how the patient reported their pain intensity. Using this information, a variable called patient improvement, significant improvement, was created to decide whether a patient's pain level improved or declined. So the patients who compiled this data set used measure to determine whether or not a patient significantly improved. So if a, if a patient improved, it was denoted as a one, and if a patient didn't improve, it was denoted as a zero. So we use this information as well as 32 other variables relating to the patient's health and demographics to analyze the data set and create a model. So we can see that um, the average pain intensity of the patients, like when they first came into the doctor's visit was around 6.5 and three months later it was around 5.9, so it decreased. So before we created our model, it was important to first draw insights from our data to visualize the different demographics. So analyzing our data beforehand provides the context needed to, to, to develop an appropriate model and to, and to interpret these results correctly. So we found that the average age of a patient was around 60 years old as seen by the graph on the left. And this makes sense because the patients suffer from chronic pain. So we also observed that the majority of the patients in our data set were female, making up a little over 60% of the patients. 
So we then wanted to compare pain intensity and find whether females or males reported higher levels of pain. On the x-axis is a pain, a scale of pain level from one to 10, and the y-axis shows the ratio or percentage of patients. Looking at the graph, we can see that females on average reported higher levels of pain, just slightly higher levels of pain. So the patients in our data set took one or more of five different drugs. And these drugs are shown on the graph and um, I bad. Okay, so yeah. And then um, on the bar chart, we wanted to visualize the percentage of people that improved after taking each drug. So on the chart, we can see that antidepressants and opiates had the lowest percentage, while the rest had a very similar result at around 60%. So then after we finished running descriptive statistics on the data, we started to work on our machine learning model. And because we had a lot of missing values in our data, we decided to ignore them in the process, meaning that any rows with missing values were dropped from the data set. So the first model we created was our decision tree. Um, so in simple terms, a decision tree is a computer generated flow chart that shows us um, basically how the computer classifies the data. In our case, we wanted to classify whether the patient improved or not. So we split our data into a training set and a test set, meaning 80% of our data would go to training the machine learning model and 20% would go to test our machine learning model and evaluate how well it performed. We wanted to dig deeper into how our model was predicting um, patient improvement. So to do this, we calculated precision and recall. So precision is the ratio between the true positives and all the positives, meaning that when the decision she model um, predicted that a patient would get better, it was correct 72% of the time. So the recall is our measure of, is the measure of our model correctly identifying true positives. So meaning that of all the patients that actually got better, recall tells us that our model correctly identified 55% of those patients. So we wanted to create a second model called a random forest, which is more um, sophisticated. So rather than just being one single decision tree, a random forest model is made up of hundreds of these decision trees, which denotes the name random forest. So using this model, we hope to create more accurate predictions. And the hope was that this model would do better um, compared to the simple decision tree. So using the same process, we calculated precision and recall, and we found precision to be 67% and recall to be 95%. So through initial analysis of our data and the creation of two different models, we found that it was pretty difficult to create a model that can accurately predict patient outcome. This might indicate that we need more variables to evaluate our patients and maybe even choose a different or more better, better machine learning model. And although the patients, although the models did not do as well as we had hoped, it is, there is a good possibility to create further iterations to improve on our work. So I wanna thank everyone that supported me through the summer and allowed me to explore research in such a positive learning environment. Um, special thanks to Dr. Boone and Solomon, as well as my mentor, Dr. Sophias, for being so patient with me. Thank you. Good job. And everyone can unmute, give her a round of applause. Excellent job. <clears throat> Any questions for Rachel? Denise, go ahead. Thanks for asking a question, Denise. Yeah. Hello. Um, my question was, um, do you think that one of the reasons why the model wasn't as accurate is because um, some of the data was dropped um, because there was missing rows? And if so, um, of the data that was dropped, was it just individual patients who were missing information or entire columns of like um, variables? So um, I definitely do think that um, maybe a reason our model wasn't as um, accurate was because we dropped um, so much of the data because we went from about 8,000 rows to maybe around like 5,000 rows. 
So yeah, it was definitely like um, something that drawback um, in creating the models. And the process for dropping the models was um, for individual patients. So if a patient had even one column or one variable that wasn't um, shown in the data set, then we had to drop the patient from our model. Any other questions? And, and Rachel, just so I'm clear, and I apologize if I missed this, your, your rows were your um, variables, which I'm assuming were pulled from like electronic health records or something from this database, this pain database. And your columns, or no, your rows were patients and your columns were your variable. How many columns did you have or how many measures did you have in your complete data set? So yeah, you're correct that the columns were the variables and the rows were the patients. So we had 32 total um, columns and then um, like around 8,000 total patients. Great, excellent. And so one of those was your outcome, which is whether or not patients what got better or not. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Good work. Any other questions for Rachel? All right, well, if not, great job. Uh, Denise, thank you for asking questions. I encourage all the students to ask each other questions uh, or for anyone to ask questions as well. Next, we have uh, Donis, who is mentored by uh, Zhao Song and Han. So Han, or Zhao Song, whoever's gonna introduce her. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to introduce Donis. Um, hi, Donis, the rising senior at Pittsburgh Taylor Allardyce High School, also a coding star. Uh, to be honest, I, I think she's really smart and a quick learner, which is very impressive. So the project we are doing was about using logistic model to predict immune response of immune checkpoint inhibitor in metastatic better cancer patient. So cancer immunology is an emerging area, but a lot of bit tough though. There are a lot of challenges, but she got but the, pic, the big picture in a very short time. I'm pretty sure uh, she will be a great young researcher in the future. Yep. Go ahead, Denise. Thank you. I'm gonna start sharing. Um, you can see the screen. We can see the screen. We can't see you, but if you don't want to turn on your screen, that's totally fine too. Okay, yeah, I feel like this is going to be a little confusing with the screen on. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, one second. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Donise, and under the mentorship of Han, and through the help of the YES program, I was able to dive into the world of cancer immunology and explore how logistic regression is able to predict immune response of the immune checkpoint, checkpoint inhibitor as a MALA-B and urothelial carcinoma patients. And so for a little background, cancer in the simplest term describes a disease that occurs when cells begin to cause uncontrollable growth and cell divisions. I feel like my slides out of order. All right, one sec. Oh, I skipped the screen. Here we go. Yes. Um, uncontrollable growth and cell division. Typically, healthy cells follow a natural life cycle to the point of atoposis, where they die so healthier cells can replace them. However, damaged cells can't tell the difference that are being told to stop dividing and to die, which leads them to build up forming tumors in the body. And tumors are bad because they tend to take away nutrients from healthier and newer growing cells, but not all tumors become malignant. But here we are focusing on the ones that does. And above is the graph of cancer immunity cycle. This cycle can be divided into seven major steps, starting with the release of antigens from cancer cells and ending with the killing of cancer cells. 
um, we were focusing on an aim to, the aim of cancer immunotherapy is to reactivate cancer's immunity cycle. We believe the more neoantigens the tumor cells can generate, the better chance for a re regenerated T, t cell to locate and remove the tumor cells. What brings us to phenotypes? Like PDL1 protein expression, the immune phenotypes also describe the available number of dysfunctional T cells in the tumor. In the immune deserted cells, um, in immune deserted, uh, cells are absent from the tumors and are all rounded. In immune excluded cells, T cells are present around the tumor but not embedded within. And for inflamed, um, they are present within the tumor. And these are the ones that will more um, will react better um, to the checkpoint inhibitor. Starting to explore this, we looked at the challenges of immune checkpoint inhibitors, which were that most patients who received the checkpoint inhibitor drug were not responding well. To combat, the, to combat this issue, we wanted to try and identify a new biomarker to predict what patients are not responding well to the drug. And we did this by looking at the DNA data and clinical data that was provided by the Morrison 2018 Clinical and Experimental Data Set. And the data set is a IM Vigor uh, 210, which is a phase two trial of the drug anthemolabi. Oh. And then here we just, I uh, here is pictured some of the data that came from the data set um, where it shows the different phenotypes and uh, their status of inflamed, deserted, excluded, and the tissue that we collected them from. So we have the bladder, um, lymph node, and kidney, um, but we were focusing on bladder. Uh, this figure comes from the Martha and Nature, uh, Nature paper, where on the right, it shows the associated genes. And on the left is the pathways or target genes. And pathways send signals within cells, um, which is usually actions that produce a change within the cell. For example, CD8 T cells can trigger autoimmune diseases such as multiple cirrhosis. And we are able to use this data in our studio's computational analysis to begin finding p-values for each targeted gene. Using R Studio, I was able to analyze the targeted genes associated and their associated genes to find their p-values and create box plot. And from the plotted data, I was able to see the p-values for all 11 plots. Um, then we conducted an anode test, a NOVA test, which is a statistical test for estimating how a quantitative dependent variable changes according to the levels of more categories Oracle and independent variables. So for our logistic models, we can see that four out of the 11 targeted genes had significant p-values, which meant that only four had an interaction with the phenotypes and that they were, their p-value was below um, 0 0.05. And over here is just the, the marker that showed us that there was four of them that had the value below 0 0.05. And here are some of the box plots. Along the x-axis of the box plot shows the three different phenotype levels. And along the y-axis shows the pathway scores, which is comprised of the average of the target genes associated gene expression. And then above is the p-value. Um, these three graphs depict uh, graphs that have p-values below the 0.05. And on the next slide shows three graphs that they pick uh, that are above the 0.05 p-value. And as you can see um, for these graphs in particular, the inflamed um, phenotype is about the same size as the rest of them, which um, isn't like a significant change, but in the ones that have the p-value below it, uh, it's much larger in all three graphs. 
And finally, this figure is the gra or graph model, model of a logistic or yeah, a logistical model. And the red line is the uh, logistic model that we created. And the blue line is a more uh, known model in the scientific world called the tumor mutation burden. And this figure shows like the blue, the blue line is, I'm sorry. Um, as shown, the logistic model uh, based on the 11 target genes uh, looks better. Ours does not look better than the current model. Which brings us to our conclusions. Um, what's next? Um, although it turns out that the current mutation tumor burden model is significantly better in the future, we hope that we can combine the two models so that we are able to predict a more accurate and overall response rate um, so, so that we can more accurately know which patients aren't responding to the ethaminophene ICI. Okay. And then for my acknowledgement, I would like to thank my amazing mentor, Han, um, Dr. Wong, Dr. David Boone, Solomon, and my teacher, uh, Dr. Waldeck, to help me get into the YES program. And the University of Pittsburgh and the Department of Bio, uh, Biomedical Informatics and the Hillman Cancer Center. Okay. And that's all, any questions? Good job, Denise. Everyone, if we could Unmute and give her a round of applause. Excellent work. Uh, and I know, Denise, this is your first time trying R, and you ended up generating tons of plots and doing tons of work. So it's great to see the final project. Any questions? Uh, Denise, I, I have a question. So for some of the variables that you found to be significant, either in, I think you're, the first thing you showed us in the black box with the, you know, the near 0.05 was maybe from your, your logistic regression. I, I saw a lot of them were FGFR um, or in the box plots you generated, which I think were kind of univariate uh, analyses. Did any of them make sense or were any of them kind of expected? Like the difference you saw between the desert and the inflamed response uh, were there, are there known things that are different between those two that you saw? And were there any novel things that, that you saw? And it's totally okay if you don't know the answer to this. Uh, just a question that, that I have, um, having never seen this data set before, but finding it very interesting. Oh, you're muted. Uh, I said in particularly, I wouldn't exactly, um, I didn't notice any um, between them. Um, I probably wouldn't know what to look for exactly. Um, so that's probably why I didn't notice them. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm sure you wouldn't know. There's no way you would know what to look for. I was just curious if you saw any of the results and you're like, oh, I'm gonna take a look deeper into these things to see if there's a reason why they may predict or not predict um, if it's an inflammed or, or or a, de a desert, um, but totally fine if you didn't. Also, it's only only a few weeks of work, so. <laughs> but nice job. Any other questions? If not, again, congratulations, Denise. Excellent job. Thank you. All right. So up next, we have Haruni and Zivia who were mentored by Tugba and Debo. So Debo, if you'd like to introduce the students. Yes, hello everyone. <clears throat> Good morning. Yes, my name is uh, Debo and I am one of the mentors to Hiruni and also to Zivia. And I, it's my pleasure to introduce both of the students today. They've worked very, very hard this summer. 
they've done such a wonderful job uh, in their analysis and all of the information regarding cancer. <clears throat> Excuse me one moment while I share my screen. Okay, back to where I was. So, uh, yes, Haruni is a student uh, near Gallaudet University, uh, the model secondary school for the deaf. And I are you a sophomore? And uh, Zivia is from the Colorado, one moment. <clears throat> Zivia is from the Colorado um, Rocky Mountain Deaf School. Both of them have been working here this summer and they've been uh, working on the computational binding affinity analysis of the polo-like domain of PLK1 and PLK2 receptors. <clears throat> so that's a basic synopsis of their computational project, <clears throat> pardon me. So they had to quickly determine the binding affinities for uh, new molecules. And this is for the treatment of cancer. So I am happy to introduce and have welcome both of them and have them join us, both Haruni and Zivia. Thank you. Thank you, Debo, for, for the introduction. One second. And you can proceed to the next slide. Next slide. There we go. So in 2020, the US uh, was predicted to see about 1 million new cancer cases and more than 600,000 cancer deaths. So cancer stem cells often have drug resistant properties that make them uh, more resistant, more immune to most anti-cancer drugs. Drug treatments like chemotherapy um, have reduced cell activity among cells, and it's more likely to kill healthy cells. However, targeted cancer therapy, uh, which we call TCT, is more effective in discriminating between cancer cells um, and healthy cells and only killing the cancer cells. So they can use different types of compounds to function better. One of these is a phytochemical compound called thymoquinone, and this is used for a multiple pharmaceutical purposes and has shown efficacy on cancer cells through binding at the polo box domain for PLK1 receptors. So our goal was to develop a faster approach to try to screen these various affinities of the different drug candidates at the PLK1 receptor. It would also help us rapidly identify targeted cancer therapy molecules for development into a drug candidate. Next slide. So PLKs are a group of receptors um, known as the polo-like kinase. So those are involved in the development of cells. PLK1 triggers cell death explicitly. So an increase in PLK1 means that uh, cell death won't happen. So any molecule can inhibit PLK1 and most likely will initiate cell death. So 
So since cancer cells have increased PLK1, they'll die, an essential part of the PLK structure is the polo-like domain, which is specific to that kinase. Next slide. So this was our overall, an overview of our methodology, and it's shown here. Um, our research group focused on performing binding affinity calculations. So that way we could narrow down the number of candidate drug molecules to choose them for a more in-depth calculation. But uh, before that, we had to validate our method by trying to reproduce the experimental results. So what we did was um, we picked five ligands that had a known experimental binding affinity for PLK1 and PLK2, and then we calculated their binding affinity and compared it with our experimental results. Okay, so here's a more in-depth, closer look at our methodology. Um, the experimental structures provide just a, a static snapshot of the proteins. But in real life, the proteins are always moving. So uh, a functional state is actually a group of structures. So what we decided to do was uh, a conformational search for the protein using normal mode analysis. So the ligand conformations were also generated and then the ligand was docked into each of the protein conformations. So the resulting 300 structures that we got from that were used to calculate binding affinity using two different methods. And then the average binding affinity was calculated and the outliers were removed. The same procedure was applied to PLK2 so that we could compare the results of them. So this is a photo of a graphic showing you the five molecules that were chosen for the study that we used. Next slide. Okay, so these are our binding affinity results. They're shown here in this table. And this is for each of the five ligands that you just saw on the previous slide. So these were the ones that found with PLK1 and PLK2. So a more negative uh, delta G value means that there is a stronger binding affinity. Great. So this is a closer look now, um, more detailed looking at the results to compare them with the experiments. Um, this slide, I'm gonna focus on the PLK1 binding results. So the table at the top shows the experimental results and a smaller IC50 value means stronger binding. So therefore experimentally T521 and TQ show stronger binding for PLK1 compared to paloxin. The second table below shows the simulation results. So when we compare the trends that you see in the yellow highlighting, we can see that our simulation successfully reproduced the experimental results. So this was uh, PLK1 and PLK2 binding. So these are the results for the, the PLK2 binding and the experiment, which is again shown at the top there, shows weaker binding uh, for all three of this. So this is um, part of our computational results. Um, there were weaker binding for all three lig ligands than for PLK1 binding. T521 shows no binding at all. And our simulations also indicate the same trend that both T521 and TQ binds to PLK2 weekly compared to their binding to PLK1. However, if you take a closer look at the yellow highlighted numbers, the experiments uh, show that there's a significant difference between T521 and TQ. TQ still retains binding to PLK2, although it is weaker. So our simulations were not able to replicate this difference. Okay, so here's a closer look at the interactions of um, T521 with PLK1 and PLK2. Um, T521 and PLK1 complex is shown on the left and you can see from the image on the left and the short video clip that we'll show you, T521 fits nicely in the polo box domain with strong interactions shown on the dotted lines. 
Uh, on the other hand, its binding to the corresponding binding pocket was absent in many of our docking results. And when it's present, it showed much less, much less interaction with PLK2, as you can see on the image on the right. So we're gonna go ahead and show you that video now. And for some reason, the video seems to be stuck. I'm not able to play it. Um, that's fine. I think we can just, if they, we have the photos. I think that's sufficient for now. We'll go ahead with our conclusions. Well, no, no, I, I'm not able to play it. That's all right. That's all right. Okay, so for our conclusion, so between PLK1 and PLK2, the binding affinities match the experimental results with uh, smaller molecules being more favorable toward PLK1 with a stronger affinity. So also the simulations reproduce the experimental binding affinity trend for PLK1. However, the experimental binding affinity for PLK2 was not able to be reproduced. So our method demonstrates that the potential for finding molecules that selectively bind to PLK1, uh, but the PLK2 experiments needs to be further refined to match the experimental results we got for PLK1. And we just wanna very much thank our mentors, um, Tugba and Debo, um, Alexander, um, Lynn, and everyone. And also we'd like to thank you PMC Academy and the both of the program coordinators, Dr. David Boone and Solomon Lipschitz. Thanks very much. Great job. And, and for this one, I'd like if again, everyone's willing to turn your cameras on and give applause. <laughs> Excellent job, girls. Great work. Any questions? So I have a question, uh, but again, anyone, please feel free to always ask questions and it's not always just me. Uh, so very interesting results. Great work. Do you have any idea of why your model seemed to work better for PKL1 than 2? Is it something with the structure of PKL1 is better defined? Uh, is it, uh, you know, the pockets of where things are binding better defined? Uh, or you're not sure at all? Here this, Hirani, I think it binded, that bound better because of the structure. And like we said, on those dotted lines, that verified that. Um, there was great binding in that. So it was based on the structure itself. So yeah, I would agree with you. It's because of the structure. And Zibi saying, yeah, we, we had done an in-depth analysis with PLK1 and compared it to PLK2, so that seemed to be it. That's great. And, and at what point in time do you think you'll be comfortable enough with your model to look at new molecules to predict whether or not you think those molecules will bind? Well, Huh. I mean, it really seems like it depends on the molecule itself and the structure and how it binds in general. So, yeah. Excellent. Any other questions? I have a question. Thanks, Neil. Oh. Um, did you notice any overarching similarities between some of the different molecules that you tested? Like, were any of them used for similar purposes? biologically or chemically? Or do you think that could have had anything to do with why those particular molecules work better in your model? So what I know for sure is that the thymoquinone, that particular 
pet uh, chemical has a biological purpose for multiple different therapies. So it could be used as it for targeted cancer treatment. Um, so that's one that we know of, it has a biological purpose. As far as some of the other ones, I'm not entirely sure. All right, great job. Again, congratulations. Uh, um, and I think we'll move on now to the last talk in our first session, which is from a returning student from the last, I believe, two years, Sam, who was mentored by Ja uh, this summer. So I will turn it over to Ja to introduce you. Ja, are you there? If so, you're muted. Let me see if I prompt her to unmute. Well, I tell you what, Sam. Uh, oh, there she is. Go ahead, Ja. Can you introduce Sam? Hello. Oh, hello. We can hear you now. There hello? you are. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> Hi. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, God. I, are you talking to me? I, I cannot hear you <clears throat> before. Yes. We're asking if it's Sam's turn, if you want to introduce Sam. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, Sam, uh, I think he graduated from high school already. He's a um, uh, looking forward to go to college uh, this fall. And Sam, um, I think Sam has um, um, achieved great um, accomplishments this summer while working with us. Um, um, he started out as uh, someone who uh, only know um, a, little bit, a little bit about Python and not much about machine learning. Uh, within two months, um, <clears throat> he actually uh, reached to the level of being able to do uh, prediction uh, using five different machine learning methods. He also applied these methods to, um, to solve a real world problem and obtain decent results. Um, also, he gained uh, extensive knowledge uh, in machine learning uh, and uh, improved his uh, programming skills greatly. So I'd like to congratulate, uh, congratulate Sam for his uh, accomplishments. I'd like to um, thank my student helper, um, um, Xiaoye Mu, for uh, working diligently with Sam this summer. Um, also, I'd like to thank David Bone to give us this opportunity. Uh, now I'd like Sam to present his work. Okay, Is, does that work now? Uh, let's see, I think. It, it's loading, but yeah, I think it's loading. going to work. Okay, yep, that's looks good. good. So, well, today I'll be presenting uh, my project, uh, Machine Learning and Ubiquitination Site Prediction. And uh, I worked on this project with my mentors, Dr. Xia Ching and Xia Yumo. And so I guess to start off with, uh, we have to answer uh, one important question. What's the deal with ubiquitination? <laughs> I'm not sorry for that, anyway. So, well, I guess to start off with, ubiquitin is this protein here. It's a uh, small regulatory protein. And ubiquitination is simply the process by which uh, ubiquitin binds to other proteins, the substrate protein. And it's actually really important because it has a huge number of regulatory functions involving other proteins. It's found in all eukaryotic cells, and it's also found pretty much all over the human body. And some of those regulatory functions include uh, basically telling proteins that it's time to die, uh, DNA repair, transcription, a bunch of other things. So it's a really important process that 
we really want to know more about because if we can figure out figure out more about ubiquitination, then we can figure out more about how our cells work, how DNA and proteins work in our body, and even create new treatments. And the first step to that is to identify the ubiquitination sites, places on the protein where ubiquitin will bind to and make effects happen. And that's key to further understanding the nature and molecular processes of ubiquitination and the things that go on after that. So uh, time for a little bit of a straying away from that. Never mind. <laughs> so the data sets that we worked with uh, specifically came from a uh, previous research done by Dr. Uh, Dr. Jiang and it's uh, physical chemical properties or PCPs as I'll be referring to them now. And <clears throat> There are uh, data sets containing uh, pieces of protein sequences connected with the physical chemical properties of their component amino acids. And for my project, I focus on the PZP1 data set, which is a relatively small data set with <coughs> 300 uh, protein segments and 531 PCPs per segment. So that might be a little complicated so just um, something good to think about is my project, we wanted to be able to use this data to figure out this data, which is whether or not ubiquitin will bind to that site. So how do we do this? Well, one way is machine learning. And well, machine learning focuses on teaching a computer to make predictions. And that'd be good and all, but uh, computers don't just make predictions for no reason. And if you just, it's just like how you can't just throw a bunch of ingredients at a kid and hope they make a cake. You got to teach them a little. And that's done by providing examples to the machine. Examples in this case being, we give them the PCP data and what we want it to figure out. So it's giving it sort of proof by example. And so that allows us to make predictions. And generally more examples result in better predictions, as long as those examples are good. So one way to tell whether or not a uh, machine learning is going well is through something called uh, k-fold cross-validation. I uh, used five uh, folds, so that's five-fold cross-validation for this project. And it's a way of sort of processing data to allow us to use it to evaluate how well uh, a method or model works. So we start off with a whole data set. And we split it into two pieces, the training data set and the testing data set. The training data set we use for well training. And each of these are folds. So in each fold, we uh, split up the data set and we take one piece of that and use that as the validation. Or we train it on all the other data pieces of the training data set. And then we test it on the validation set. And we do this five different times each um, time using a different segment as the validation. And then from that, we can get a trained model. And, the and this is where we, the testing data set comes in useful because now the uh, model has never seen the testing data set before, which means that we can figure out how well it, it would work for new, uh, for new information or things we actually want to predict by putting it together and evaluating it. So that's good and all, but we have to sort of figure out, well, what do we want to do with this? So the method that I use for machine learning is called uh, support vector machines, SVMs, which I'll call them from now on. And it's a way of analyzing data and creating models for classification, which is the specific, pro uh, specific type of thing we want to do. Classification being, we get all these inputs about uh, what, the, uh, what an object is like, and then we classify it whether or not it's something or not that thing. So example, uh, this is a simple model. Uh, whether or not a dog will be friends with you. And here we have a scattered thing. And the number of treats and the number of head pads and smiley face is the dog will be friends with you. Unhappy face is the dog will not be friends with you. So what SVM does is it 
finds a model, this line that basically lets us know that, okay, um, if we have some uh, a new data set, maybe there's something here, and we don't know whether or not a new dog, and we don't know whether or not it'll be friends with us or not, then the model sort of allows us to see, okay, if it's here, then based on all our previous results, that must mean it's probably going to be friends. And so that's good and all, but another reason why uh, we wanted to go with SVM is because it's actually really useful for more complicated data. So let's uh, use a different example. Uh, the same thing, but with humans. Humans are complicated, you know? You can't just like give them treats and they'll be happy. You can't just pat their heads because then they'll be weirded out. So what uh, SVM actually allows us to do is it can uh, actually allow us to transform the data to something that is easily um, modeled. So warping space and time to allow us to turn this mess into this. And from there, we can create a model that's not linear and might not even be in the same dimension as we're used to. That's really useful because as I mentioned before, uh, we have 531 different PCPs and each one of those sort of make a different dimension. So we are dealing with 531 dimensional data here. So the process. So first we tune the SVM hyperparameters through grid search just to get a baseline. And then I perform cross, five-fold cross-validation on SVM. And in order to compare it to other methods, I also ran it on random forest, cane nearest neighbor, decision tree, and gradient boosting. Those four are just other methods of machine learning, which I won't really go into, but they're also pretty promising. And then I evaluate the different classification methods using ROC curves. And well, and so these are ROC curves. And a bit to explain, ROC curves sort of allow us to see the trade-off between how, um, how often do we want it to get to say something is, to get the right answer, to say something is true when it is true, versus how often we want it to avoid saying something is true when it's not true. And these are the graphs. And what we see here is these aren't the best. What we actually want is something closer to this. But this being real life, if we actually saw that here, we'd uh, be worried because uh, that typically means that our model is too good and life is not nice. So. And uh, graphs are a little hard to read. So here's just the math. <laughs> so uh, what this sort of does is the mean train AUC area on the curve, uh, we want it to be closer to one because that means that the model is more accurate for that. Training AOC is the uh, information we get from the cross-validation part of the five-fold cross-validation. And the test AOC is what happens when we feed it completely new data. How well is it at getting the right answer? And percent difference AOC is a metric that we use to sort of figure out how much a model overfits, which is something that can happen to uh, machine learning where it gets uh, so highly trained on a specific set of data that it no longer has the ability to uh, take in new data and get a normal answer anymore. It is too good at reading the data it already knows and not good enough at reading new data essentially. And we also uh, calculated refit time, which sort of tells us how computationally intensive something is. And the results at first don't really seem to be going in SVM's favor because, well, gradient boosting is uh, the best at the mean test AUC, finding new information. And SVM isn't even the least computationally intensive. That one goes to decision tree. So, uh, um, that one goes to decision tree, which doesn't even have that bad of a test AUC. And so at first that sort of seems like a bad thing. Like, okay, we did this whole project about SVM and now we're seeing, oh, it's not that great. Well, that could have been the case except for one thing. And that has to do with the percent different AOC. If you notice how pretty much everything here, every other method has a percent difference AOC of greater than 5%. And that suggests that there's, they're not very good at avoiding overfitting uh, in this, uh, which means that uh, these decent results could very well just be that it's good at it's very good at uh, figuring out the data that it has. Well, SVM 
seems to have be create models that are more generalizable. So things that you can feed new data into and you'll get more consistently uh, reasonable results. And so conclusions, uh, SVM actually did better than previous published results regarding AUC. Uh, previous papers by Dr. Jang sort of put SVM at around uh, 0.6597 uh, AUC score, while ours was, if we go back, 0.678. So that's actually pretty good. And we think that's because uh, we were able to use, uh, we were able to tune the hyperparameters beforehand. And it was also best at avoiding overfitting compared to other methods, which is going to be important because if we actually want to use this for new data, then it has to be able to reason, it has to be able to process that data, uh, even if it has never seen it before. And next steps. Well, one uh, next steps include more hyperparameter tuning. Currently, we only tune three hyperparameters, and SVM has, I'm going to say, like around 10 or more. So we can do that, and maybe that'll help us get better models. Also, statistical testing to better compare the methods. Right now, it's just based on uh, very crude uh, statistics of how it works. And so more statistical testing can actually allow us to figure out where, um, how the models compare uh, in more depth and also additional data sets. As I mentioned before, we only used one data set, PCP1, and there are six. So it'd be interesting to see how well, uh, how well these trends stack up when compared to uh, different models, I meant different data sets with different information. And so that closes out my project. And to end, I'd sort of like to, I'd like to acknowledge and thank my mentors, uh, Jia Yumo and Dr. Uh, Jia Jing uh, with the Jing's AI lab at the Department of Biomedical Informatics. Uh, I couldn't have done any of this without their help and their expertise. And for also putting up with me, uh, <laughs> that's sometimes a hard thing to do. And also special thanks to uh, Dr. David Boone, Solomon Lewschitz, and the University of Pittsburgh and the Hillman Cancer Center, especially for letting me come back. I, I did not expect that, and I'm really thankful that I was had the chance to come back and do this research. It was really cool. And yeah, any questions? Great job, Sam. So again, I asked to either unmute or turn on your cameras and, and applaud Sam. Good work. And it's always important to applaud yourself. Good job, Sam. Yes. <laughs> Excellent job. Any questions? Debo has a question. Sure. I'm curious about your process of trying to teach uh, the computer to predict. What is the first step that you took to give it that information from a real experiment um, or was that um, just from other data? So the data that we used uh, came from previous experiments uh, and uh, specifically the data sets we used were um, they, uh, was data that was processed and packaged into a more easy, easily readable uh, format for the computer uh, in a previous paper by Dr. Uh, uh, Jiang. And so, uh, so yeah, the data that we used was already processed beforehand, but also to feed it in, we took out the data, uh, created sort of, uh, created sets of here are the predictors, the PCPs, and here's what we want to predict for the ubiquitous nation, whether or not it will happen. And from that, the computer sort of took it from there because computers are very good at taking data and saying, oh, it is a thing. And they're figuring out what to do without us knowing exactly how it did it. Good job, Sam. Sam, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so you compared a lot of different machine learning techniques. Yeah. Can you tell me, did you do hyperparameter tuning in all of those techniques or just on SVM? And could it that if, if you didn't do hyperparameter tuning, could it be that that's why SVM did better? 
that could be the case. We didn't really do as extensive tuning on the other methods. It was uh, more just here's a general thing that gives us the results that would be reasonable. So a definite next step would also be to extend tuning to the other methods. Yeah. Great. And I think Donise had a question. I saw her hand go up. Maybe not anymore. Oh, no, I still have the question. Great. Uh, well, it's not really a question. It's more of like um, like a comment, sort of. Um, I was just going to add in, um, since I was new to like machine learning this year and like trying to find a way to learn R, and um, like my whole project was like based on my final model, which was a ROC plot, um, which that, that had like a TPR and FPR. And I just wanted to say that I liked your explanation of it. Um, Cause I kind of didn't know what it did. I just knew there's some numbers at it. It gives you a free graph. <laughs> that, that, don't worry that, that everyone has that stage. Some more than others. I'm one of the others. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Denise. Ja, did you have something? I don't see. If, I don't know if it's. Yeah, go ahead, Ja. You're muted though. You're muted, Ja. Um, I'm not sure she can hear me. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yep, I mean. So I think, uh, David, your question is very important. It's very good. Um, I think you know to do a fair comparison, we should do actually grid search for every method. And so I'm thinking to suggest like Sam continue work on this, and I think uh, the results might be worth a, a publication even. So I think, do you mind about that? That's my question really. So I like to get Sam to, if he's willing to do it, to do like extended work, you know, after this and hopefully get a publication on this. You're okay, right? Oh, absolutely. I am more than happy for students to keep doing work if that's mutually agreeable. That's I awesome. See, I see, yeah. And so Sam, we can maybe schedule a meeting later. Okay. Yes. Oh, great. That's my question. All right. Great job, Sam. And uh, just one more uh, congratulations to the whole first round of speakers. All of you did amazing. Congratulations. Uh, we are now going to take a break, a 15 minute break. Uh, the next session will start at 1040. We will try to promptly start at 1040. So if you can come back at 1038, that would be amazing. So congratulations again, and let's all take a, a, a needed break and I'll see you all in a few minutes.
All right. So welcome back to the second session where we have four more great speakers lined up for you. Uh, we're just going to jump right in uh, on, on this session. So our first talk will be from Ryan, who was mentored by Lang. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you to introduce Ryan. Hi, everyone. This is Liang Zhan from the ECE department. So my student, my student is Ryan Krishna. So uh, his project is to explore some um, deep learning algorithm uh, and apply the deep learning uh, AI technique to the X-ray of the hands. So Ryan, it's your time. Thank you. Once again, my name is Ryan Krishna, and I am from Winchester High School, and it is my pleasure to speak to you about bone age identification. I will share my screen now. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Great. So my project is on bone age identification, and I was pleasurably mentored by Dr. Lian Zhang. Okay, so some key terms to know before we begin is, so the first one is ROI extraction. This is region of interest extraction, which means basically pulling out the most important features of an image. The next one is layers, which are different parts of a model which help to narrow down results. MAE is mean absolute error, and that calculates the accuracy of our model. Max pooling also helps in narrowing down our results by pulling out the sharpest features of an image. And then there are three sections to our training, including training, validation, and testing. Training trains the model, validation validates the model and makes sure it's as accurate as possible. And then testing is finally testing the model on our test data set. So why is it important to be able to figure out the age of someone based on the x-ray? Well, the first would be in malnourishment. In cases of a child who is malnourished, their x-rays may be may look like a seven-year-old's x-ray when in reality they're a 15-year-old. So from this seven-year-old's x-ray, we can see that the metacarpals over here are more spaced apart, and you can see that the bone is clearly not as developed as a 15-year-old's x-ray, where everything is more whole and sound. Now. This is important because if you x-ray a child whose parents say that they're 15, but in reality the child's hand x-ray looks like it's a seven-year-old's x-ray, then we know that either the child is malnourished because of environmental effects or because perhaps the parents are abusive. So this is also helpful in elite sports and immigration, which I'll talk about on the next slide. So for elite sports, taken from the Sideline Sports Journal, it is quoted that age fraud allows older athletes to compete against younger kids. And this is exactly what Little League's baseball player Danny Almont did, in which he played against kids who were significantly younger than him by approximately three years. And by the end of his career, he had stricken out approximately 62 out of 70 batters. And he made headlines as one of the best young Little League player, but in reality, after he was exposed as older than he had said he was, there was controversy across the nation, the US. And this is also helpful in immigration, especially regarding jobs and immigrating from the US to Europe or the other, vice versa. So it's best to know the honest age of someone, and one way we can do this is by getting an x-ray of their hand and having an approximate age based off of what they said and based off of what we predict. So for my data, I was given a training data set consisting of 12,611 images, a validation data set consisting of 1,425 images, and then a testing data set containing 200 images. The labels for each of these images had an ID, which corresponds to each image, a bone age, which gave me the truth of each image, which means that every image the bone age was exactly correct. If I have an image that says 124, then it's 124 months old. And then I was also given the gender, whether the individual is male or female. Now, the goal of this project, once again, is to create a deep learning algorithm to predict the age of an individual given an x-ray of their hand. So my framework utilized Python, 
And especially in Python, we use TensorFlow and Keras for the machine learning aspects of the program. So we start with the hand radiograph, also known as the X-ray, and we go into pre-processing. This is basically normalizing our data, for example, making sure all the images are the exact same size. In my case, it was 256 pixels by 256 pixels. And this made it so that each image can flow through the model without any difficulty. We then go into ROI extraction, which is region of interest extraction, and that's pulling out the sharpest portions of the images and keeping track of them. Segmentation and feature extraction are attached to that in which we apply a number, in this case an age and months, to each value, and the largest group of our hand that shows up has a value, and that value is repeated as our age at the end of the model. And that's the classification factor. At the end of the model, we feed it an x-ray, and then it classifies it as an age based on the different features that were present in the picture. And for example, if we had an x-ray that had different features, then it would tell us our bone age would be 14 years old, for example. Now, these are not my results. So what we have here are two graphs, one with a high spread and one with a lower spread. And I'll talk about this more. So here our x-axis is the actual age, and our y-axis is the predicted age. So ideally, we want our actual age to be equal to the predicted age, in which we would get this blue line. Now, if all our predictions were exactly accurate, then we wouldn't see any of these red dots. So each of these red dots represents the difference between our actual age and our predicted age. And this is closest to what our results were. This specific picture had a mean average accuracy mean absolute error of around 13, whereas ours were a, bit, were a bit larger as 20. So ours would have a little bit larger spread. Now, this is what we want ours to become, where our mean average accuracy, mean, average, mean absolute error is fairly low. And you can see that the spread of this graph is lower. It's closer to the median line. Now, there are two different models that are important in identifying the age of bone, the Groylich pile and the Tanner White House. Now, my model follows the Groylich pile model, and this is good for two reasons. One is that the Groylich pile is faster and it has a good accuracy. What happens with the Groylich pile is that each feature has an age, and the largest feature that is present in the in the X-ray of the hand gets reproduced as age. So. If the feature has an age of 14, and that's the largest feature on the hand, then the age of the bone is 15. Now, this model is faster and has a good accuracy. Now, the Tanner White House is a bit slower model. In fact, it's a lot slower, in ranging about three times as slow as the Gorillic Pile. And it does have a better accuracy. However, in the 5% range, the accuracy does not make a difference, because it is so close to perfect that it doesn't matter. What the Tanner White House model does is it assigns each feature a different number, and whether the feature is smaller or larger, it adds them all up, and then that final number is your bone age. Now, how can this be used in the future? So already there are um, convolutional neural networks, that's our machine learning model, that are used for detecting pneumonia in chest x-rays. And there's work on creating machine learning models which can track bone tumors as well as brain tumors given an MRI of the brain. Now, these all use the same standard sequence of a bunch of spatial convolutional layers. It's, this is all normalizing the data. And then max pooling, which pulls out the most important features. And then you can see in this diagram, you start out with this large amount of features, and then each one gets narrowed down into just two data sets, or even one, and then that's that one data set at the end is your result. So in this entire project, we learned about how machine learning and how, how we can use machine learning and how it can be applied, namely with moving it towards chest x-rays and brain MRIs, and this is why the technology is necessary. If we have, for example, a large amount of x-rays, then having a radiologist 
look through millions of x-rays in a small amount of time can be vastly decreased the time if we had a machine learning model look at them instead and set a threshold so that if this percentage of them is normal then the radiologist looks at them if it's not normal then the radiologist sorry if, the, if it's not normal then the radiologist looks at them if it is normal then the radiologist does not need to look at them now we also learned about how different layers of a model can affect accuracy normally normaling the data normalizing the data as well as the max pooling effect which can feature extract and help improve the accuracy with the largest features and then this method of machine learning is the most efficient with the Gorilla pile ranging faster than the Tanner White House with the approximate same amount of accuracy. Now, I would like to thank the Hillman Cancer Research Academy for hosting this program, Dr. David Boone and Solomon Lipschitz for their amazing coordinating and help with my project throughout the program. I'd also like to thank my mentor, Dr. Lian Zhang, who was available at almost any time, even at like 2 a.m. on a weeknight. And I would like to thank his PhD student, Hao Tang Tang, for helping me with coding problems in Python, uh, quite a bit of those. And I would also like to thank my family, especially Neil, as well as my wonderful teachers from Winchester High School who helped me get into this program. Thank you very much. Any questions? Great job, Ryan. Again, unmute our cameras. Let's give him a round of applause or thank you or congratulations, Ryan. Good work, good work. Any questions? Uh, uh, Ryan, a quick question. Did you try to um, estimate the age uh, for male and the female separate or you still mix them together? So when I was running my model, I had an approximate time of two hours for each epoch. So I was not able to input the male versus female and find out the statistics of that, except that should, that'll be my goal in the near future. I see. Yeah. That's great. Any other questions? I was actually going to ask something similar because if you, for the the scans that you were able to accurately predict if you found any features that were common to them? Because I can imagine uh, perhaps an algorithm that says, uh, you know, we are highly like, this is highly likely to be right versus maybe there are ones with certain features that were harder to predict. And that way you could kind of, if you were, the goal is to give these to a pathologist to review, they mm -hmm. could spend more time on the ones that you think are less likely that your algorithm is correct. So, and you probably didn't have time to do this, but maybe gender is one possibility or some other covariate uh, of um, a feature that makes it more likely that your model was accurate. Do yeah. you have any insights? So we did not get to that yet, except I had an idea about that. And my idea was that if we set a program to instead look at a bunch of normal x-rays and identify an x-ray as normal or not, then in my head, we can set a threshold value saying this is 98% normal. A pathologist does not, a radiologist does not need to look at this x ray. Whereas this is 70% normal, it could help to have a radiologist look at this x ray. Excellent, Ryan. Thanks. Yeah, radiologist. Um, uh, so great job. Congratulations. Really nice done. Thank you. And our next speaker will be Olatova, who was mentored by Song Zhen and Li Fan. So Li Fan, if you want to introduce Olatova. Yes, uh, I'm very glad that uh, Olatova has joined our lab this summer to work on the project of uh, footprinting analysis on the ataxic. Uh, I guess the content would be, content will be quite packed. So uh, please take, this, take the stage, Olatova. Uh,
Okay. Uh, my project for Hillman was identifying transcription factor binding sites with ATEX with attack seek data. And I was mentored by Dr. Song Jian Lu and Li Fan Liang. Just as an outline for my presentation, I'm going to give an introduction to the project and the project's background, as well as an overview of the project, including the project summary, as well as the techniques used. And then finishing off with the accuracy of the techniques, techniques used, as well as the conclusion. As for the background of our project, uh, it was centered around gene expression and the intersections of machine learning. And gene expression is essentially the process in which the segment coding of a gene in our DNA is copied and transcripted, transcripted into an RNA sequence. And this process often needs to help with transcription factors, also known as abbreviated as TFs. And machine learning is a field that enables computers to self-learn from training data Machine learning algorithms are able to detect patterns and learn from them in order to make their own predictions. And our project was using constructing a neural network, which is a computational method to identify these transcription factor binding sites. Uh, more on transcription factors. Transcription factors are proteins that control the rate of transcription of genetic information from DNA to RNA by binding to a specific DNA sequence. And with this in mind, we can conclude that transcriptions factors play a critical role in gene expression. And as transcription factor binding sites are protected by bound proteins, the cleavage events will not happen within the binding sites. They tend to happen before and after the binding sites. When using TN5 transpersase to generate a taxi data, which leads to a footprinting in the binding site. Each DNA footprint is a potential for transcription factor binding sites. And now I'll give an overview or a summary of our project. Uh, the goal of the project was to identify transcription factor binding sites using a taxi cancer cell line data. And in the end, we employed two different techniques for the identify identification and of transcription factor binding sites, a Fourier transform and neural network method. Uh, the first technology that we used was a, for, a discrete Fourier transform. It's a mathematical approach. And the discrete Fourier transform can transform the attack seek data from a time domain into a frequency domain signal where we would have large amplitudes for some low frequency ways for transcription factor binding sites. And these frequency amplitudes were used as an input for the neural network. As seen by the graph are different forms of signals as well as the as discrete Fourier transform formula. Uh, here, was a graph of the signals, including the mixed single signals for the time domain, as well as the deconvolution for the frequency domain. And this was uh, transformed in the Fourier transform function. And we noted their amplitudes, as well as the periods of the sample sequence, the number of periods in the sample sequence. The second technology that we use was a neural network. A neural network is a type of machining, machine learning based computational method, and they consist of three types of layers. The first layers, layer is an input layer, which is the initial data for the neural network, as well as a hidden layer, which is the internet the intermediate layer between the input and output layer where the, all the computation is done. And the output data is the results from the given inputs. We use the scikit-learn platform, which is a popular machine learning library with its MLP classifier function. And the MLP classifier generates a set of outputs from a set of inputs, being the data set of our experiment. Uh, here is a code sample, sample of our neur neural network. So essentially, we imported libraries. Then we made a function to read the data 
open it, uh, print uh, X and Y values to use as inputs and outputs and return them. And then we also added a function to project to check the prediction's accuracy and then print the results of the accuracy. And here was the code for our Fourier transform function. And essentially, we used the output from the Fourier transform function as an input for the neural network. And then as part of the neural network, we added uh, layer sizes, as you can see, the input layers and the hidden layers. And we also printed the results and made a program to check, just recall the function to, project, to check the prediction's accuracy. Uh, in real data, we hypothesize that the frequency domain of the attack seek cleavage signals contain features that indicate the presence of footprints. And here's an overview of how we constructed the, of the construction of the training data set. The alignment file, which is them, was processed by the hint attack to generate the nucleotide free cleavage signals. The binding sites of two transcription factors, transcription factors CTCF and June, were determined by motif, motif matching and transcription factor chip seek peaks. For the positive data set, it's centered around the transcription factor binding site and extended uh, 75 base pairs. And for the negative data set, uh, there were 151 BPS long regions flanking the positive data set. And here we were applying the discrete Fourier transform to the neural network. So based on the output from the Fourier transform, we were able to use it as a suitable input for the neural network. And here's a code sample of that in action. And then finally, the accuracy of our results. Uh, the optimization of the neural network resulted in 89% total accuracy. And we were able to optimize and increase the accuracy of the neural network by experiment, experimenting and fine tuning the size of the hidden layers as seen here. Uh, the ideal combination that we found was uh, 50, 40, and 30. And just to close off, uh, I'd like to thank the Hillman Center Academy, Dr. Boone, Mr. Lashitz, my mentor, Song Jian Lu, and Li Fan Liang. Thank you. Great job. So again, let's give a round of applause or uh, however you'd like to do that. Great work. Any questions? Sri, did I see you have a question? Oh, no. <clears throat> I thought I saw an unmuting. So, so I do have, I have a question. It's a similar question I've asked in the past. So you had an accuracy of about 89%, which is great. That's a, that's a really high accuracy. Uh, are you concerned at all with overfitting or um, was this controlled for in any way? And it's okay if you don't know too. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, no, no problem. And in Olatoba, you if you want to enter into AMIA, so it, I haven't mentioned this before, all the students are doing computational work. Uh, I encourage them to enter into the AMIA High School Scholar Program if the mentors uh, agree to do so. But you'll have a little bit of work because you'll have to cut down your slides to, to 12 slides because they are very strict. So just something to think about going forward, but, but really nice job. Any other questions? All right, then I think we'll move on to our next speakers and it's another group presentation uh, with Sri and Sahana and the mentor was Madhavi, so Madhavi. Yeah, 
Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the two students who work with me. Uh, Sahana Mohan is a rising senior at Monta Vista High School. Uh, she studies biology and chemistry, and uh, she previously carried out research um, on related to COVID-19. And uh, she's also studying physical therapy and medical communication. Um, Sri Dr. Balamkonda is a rising junior in North Allegheny High School. He's studying the AP level uh, CS biology, CS and biology courses in school, and uh, he's among the top bankers in debate and regional science trial competitions. He teaches younger students about guiding principles of in the way of living. He's also a tennis coach, I think. Last part, I'm not sure. Uh, both of them have also volunteered um, uh, in various activities for social good. Uh, it was really it was really great to see a wonderful team work between the two of them. So I'll leave it to them to present uh, present stuff. Uh, is my screen shared? Yes, it looks good. Okay, sounds good. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Srivatsa. And uh, our project was studying the molecular mechanisms of immunotherapy signature genes through protein interactions. So before we really get into our project, we wanted to first talk about cancer, one of the leading causes of death worldwide. And according to the World Health Organization in 2020, it's killed over 10 million people. Cancer has been around for a while now. And it was first documented by the Egyptians somewhere in between 3000 and 1500 BC. And since then has been one of the most common diseases resulting from uncontrolled cell proliferation and poor regulation of mutated cells. We've all heard about the traditional methods to cancer treatment like chemotherapy, radiotherapy and surgery. But let's talk about a more, common, a more recent treatment that has grown with advancements in biological and robotic technology. Um, Sahana, I think uh, your audio. The audio is not coming. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, sorry. Um, that treatment is immunotherapy, which is able to use a patient's own immune system as a solution to kill cancer cells and prevent the further spread of tumors. It's able to work without actually acting directly on cancerous tumors or cells and leaves patients well protected from going through a relapse, which has been seen as a medical advantage. The three main types that are commonly used and that are typically involved with immune checkpoint genes, which generally regulate the cell cycle, are immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are drugs that promote the immune response by stopping cancerous cells from growing uncontrollably, targeted cell therapy, which promotes the immune response by boosting T and B cells, as well as monoclonal antibodies, which generally amplify or suppress the immune response. But even with immunotherapy, there have been certain drawbacks, like fluctuating success rates, because every patient differently respond, responds differently to treatments, and also being that treatment essentially cannot be applicable, applicable to all types of cancer. It varies from tumor to tumor, person to person, and tissue to tissue. Look at the pictures in front of you. On the left-hand side, you'll notice different tumors of various shapes and sizes indicating their differences. And to the right, you'll see how each tissue indicates a different signature. A solution though, are gene expression signatures, which are a unique combination of genes from patients and individual cells that's used to promote specificity in the diagnosis process. Uh, this would make it easier to analyze their genetic makeup and see which treatments would prove to be most effective. So by personalizing this uh, and personalizing immunotherapy to each person's environment and understanding their genetic variations throughout the various molecular subtypes of each cancer, uh, determining treatment options has been made much easier. So we chose to study gene expression in relation to cancer and immunotherapy, specifically for a type of cancer that commonly affects the female reproductive system called endometrial carcinoma. Studies have shown that when this type of cancer metastasizes or relapses, immunotherapies like monoclonal antibodies, which fight against immune checkpoint proteins, have proved effective, but that effectiveness has been relatively limited. 
One study used bioinformatics analysis to identify these ICGs that could be significant as prognostic factors for immunotherapeutic responses in EC patients, working beyond these previously established limitations. These researchers were able to classify the genes by grouping the expression levels of 521 tumors from various patient samples through RNA sequencing, specifically for molecular subtypes of EC. In turn, they created these unique patient profiles, which then helped to determine how a patient would respond to immunotherapy. So our project aimed to look at the various ICGs and find their relevance to various biological processes and pathways using protein interactions by interpreting the data from this paper. This ultimately showed how they could act as biomarkers to analyze tumor microenvironments and immunotherapy for endometrial carcinoma. So in the specific article that we studied regarding endometrial carcinoma and gene expression signatures, there were a total of 47 ICGs in this, that were used in the study. And for our project, some of them were used to carry out further analysis. Seven of the ICGs uh, were associated with prognosis in EC patients, and a gene signature was accurately predicted for four of them. But one of them, specifically the ICG TNFR SF14, overlapped between two of these groups. Our project studied 10 of the ICGs in depth as genes that could determine responses to immunotherapy, making them relevant as immune signature genes or ISGs. This helped us further explain uh, the mechanisms by which genes play a role in the response to immunotherapy. So to analyze this data in a biologically relevant way, we looked at protein-protein interactions or PPIs. PPIs describe how proteins interact with one another as a result of certain biological pathways and events. So by looking at PPIs through a biological lens in conjunction with computational analyses, we were able to understand the topic of gene expression signatures and their contribution to cancer treatment personalization. So to explore the scientific reasoning behind many of the nuances of immunotherapy suitability, we use network and functional enrichment analysis regarding a protein interactome, along with already present gene analysis software tools. So we utilized a technique that was actually developed by our mentors research group called High Precision Protein-Protein Interaction Prediction, or HIPIP, which allowed for further interpretation of human PPIs. This method was used to assemble the interactome with known and predicted interactions of the 10 ISGs that we identified in the study. The PPIs were predicted by computing features of protein pairs for various cellular processes, and these interactions aided in analyzing the biological pathways and functions that the genes were involved in. The interactome did show both known and novel interactors, but we chose to study the novel interactors, which are labeled here in this picture as red for both their nodes and edges. Also, one thing to note is that the dark blue common genes were the initial I ICGs that we had recognized. So in, er in order to interpret the ISG interactome, a similar network analysis was conducted using an online tool called WebGestalt, which is essentially a gene set analysis toolkit that takes gene lists and essentially translates it into like biological processes. It contains like all the human genes and processes and uses softwares uh, to overlap uh, the genes and essentially cross-check uh, an inputted gene list to calculate biological processes, pathways, and disease enrichment. So in WebGestalt, there are like many different types of analysis that you can use. So we use the network topology-based analysis, which allows a thorough representation or interpretation of the gene list, including the ISGs we found relevant and includes information about the properties of nodes and edges regarding the genes within a network and its modules, which show a various immune signature genes and how they're connected and essentially how they contribute to biological processes and pathways. And also with the network analysis, we were able to visualize the common biological processes that the genes were involved in, which was important to help us see which ones were cancer related and could have a potential contribution to immunotherapy and tumor related pathways. So this genotology enrichment graph of the ISG interactome shows the novel interactors relevance in specific biological pathways. The nodes identify where the genes functions overlap and how they're related to each other. So the red labeled sections are related to more specific, highly refined processes, while the higher up yellow labeled sections refer to parent terms in the higher order. 
So there were a lot of terms and results that came up. So we decided that genes that were associated with more specific tumor or cancer associated terms like B cell or T cell activation, regulation of apoptosis, cell proliferation, regulation of immune processes were noted as relevant and we further stu- and we studied them further. As these molecules and pathways were already known in, to be relevant in regards to cancer and immune response, it kind of made more sense for us to investigate them because it was likely that they had a role in cancer or tumor pathways and could potentially take a part in potential treatments or therapies. So after the ISGs were selected and the novel interactors were studied from the predicted interactome with WebGestalt, each interactor was cross-checked using a Java-based tool called Bingo, which is an extension to another software called Cytoscape. And this was able to conduct similar enrichment analysis to WebGestalt, but in a slightly different way to help us establish the novel interactor significance from what we already knew from the NTA graph. This cross-checking allowed us to better understand the gene ontology terms, and after this was carried out, the relevant genes in the context of gene expression profiling were further investigated. So uh, there ended up being seven novel interactors, uh, I'm like hovering over them right now, uh, from the predicted interactome that were further studied in PubMed using the keywords cancer immunotherapy and tumor microenvironment. So each novel interactor was related to one of the 10 original ICGs that we investigated as shown in the table here. Uh, On the left side, you see the ICGs uh, that is in the ISG and on the right, you see the novel interactors. So this search in PubMed was using the keywords uh, cancer uh, cancer and immunotherapy in association with every single type of gene that we investigated and showed that the novel interactors had many significant contributions. The most commonly affiliated processes and abilities of these novel interactors included anti-proliferative effects, um, immune cell regulation, tumor suppression, as well as acting as biomarkers or tumor indicators. These functions were noted to be significant for immunotherapies and as a part for developing treatments or prognoses. So to kind of summarize, we studied the background and literature about immunotherapy signatures, exploring one paper more in depth that had identified these ISGs computationally. And to analyze these genes in particular, we used various analyses from creating the PPI interactome to using network analysis and functional enrichment studies with WebGestalt and Bingo. And we also navigated published papers to really understand how the novel interactions we identified were relevant. We were also able to write an abstract and officially connect the literature review And also with the help of our mentor, we were actually able to put together a research paper, which a first kind of rough draft can be found at this link on the screen. Uh, So uh, did my screen switch from the Google Slides to? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, our mentor's website and here you can find um, our abstract, uh, which is here and our, and our paper, uh, I won't go through the whole thing, but because it's kind of long right now. But um, yeah, so you, this these are accessible um, at this link. Uh, I think we could provide it in the chat, or we could send it out later. So, kind of as a future direction, as what we want to do, uh, we hope to carry out like future anal- further analysis uh, using other kinds of computational methods. And after this, we plan on submitting a submitting this research to a preprint server and to the AMIA conferences. And kind of a long-term goal that we have is to study genes related to immunotherapies for other cancers individually and integratedly to infer mechanisms that overlap, hopefully. Um, uh, yeah, so lastly, we wanted to uh, thank a lot of people that were uh, kind of crucial. Uh, so first we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Madhuri Ganapathir Aju uh, for her crucial guidance. Uh, and obviously we did a project and that was uh, really uh, insightful for us, but uh, really the learning experience was the biggest gift. I learned so much about cancer genes and proteins, but I also learned about different kinds of softwares, computing systems, and just analyzing papers. And these are skills that I really believe will equip me for uh, my future wherever I go. So thank you so much for everything you've done. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Boone and Solomon uh, for organizing the Hillman Academy, especially during COVID, um, really for high school students to have like an opportunity like this, uh, especially for the social activities, the speakers and the research roundtables. I really enjoyed all of them. Um, so thank you. 
And finally, to the Cosby Group, uh, thanks for the research roundtables and good luck uh, to everyone who still needs to present and congrats for everyone who already presented. Yeah, um, thank you to our mentor and for Dr. Boone Solomon again for putting together Hillman and really creating this invaluable experience to not only learn about research, but gain really insightful knowledge about cancer biology and computational analysis. I think one thing that has really um, kind of impacted me is learning how bioinformatics and computational analysis and biology can intersect. And I hope that's something I can carry in whatever career I decide to pursue. And also just in general, being becoming more confident in these types of presentations and doing this type of research, something I hope to just carry through um, throughout college and all my years. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Excellent, good job. Again, let's unmute or turn cameras on and give them a round of applause. Great work. Thank you. Any questions? It was a pleasure interacting uh, with uh, both of them over the summer. Uh, and I also want to say once again that it was really good teamwork also that they worked with each other very well and uh, carried out very good work. All right. Any questions from anyone else? So I'll ask the question, David, if you, if you don't mind. Please, so, go ahead. Um, yeah, so uh, basically you mentioned uh, in the beginning of the talk that there is a tumor heterogeneity from uh, tumor to tumor and various cancer types and so on. Uh, as people go about identifying um, these signature genes about immunotherapy, how do you think they, it might look when you put the, all of those genes together? So how does the heterogeneity in various tumors versus various immune therapy genes, um, do you think they'll be different, they'll be similar? What might be going on? Well, the goal is to see if there are any intersections between any of them, and I think that would be useful for any kinds of therapies. Uh, that's obviously would be, uh, if that's possible, and if we found that, then I think that would translate to having like a better process to find treatments if there are overlaps. Uh, so I, I yeah, and I think also just for really complex like cancers that have so many different molecular subtypes that their heterogeneity is like really just far beyond um, what we can really predict. I think that there's a lot more work with what you mentioned to be done to really see how each patient with each specific tumor can how they'll how that patient will respond to immunotherapy. And I think that's why these ISG are so important to keep working with and doing this kind of analysis with to make that process more specific. Great. And I have one additional question. So did you happen to look at any of the novel interactors that you found? Go back to the initial data set from that paper where you you pulled out uh, your first 10 uh, that you built your network to see if any of those novel interactors in that data set were predictive of prognosis, diagnosis, or otherwise were differentially expressed? If uh, Did you go back and look at any of the novel interactors in the original data set? So I think in the original data set, in the high expression area, which I think was like labeled red on the genes that they had um, sequenced and RNA sequenced, some of the ICGs did match I don't think we did like a specific thorough analysis of the novel interactors. I think that's definitely an interesting point that I hope we can do like very soon in the near future. But um, I think between all of them, there were some overlaps, but I wouldn't be able to, I think, draw any specific conclusions yet. Okay, great. But it is uh, worth looking, I mean, not worth looking at, you should look at this because it's an important question that David asked. Um, so as you prepare for your um, for the work, um, uh, take a look at that data. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Great, great job and, and congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and our next speaker and last speaker of this session is Jasmine, who was mentored by Greg, Jinwa, and Luigi. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Greg to introduce Jasmine. Okay. Uh, can you hear me, David? Yes, sound great. Great. Okay. Good morning. Um, it's really been my pleasure to work with Jasmine this summer. Um, she is a rising sophomore at Winchester Thurston in Pittsburgh, um, and she expressed an interest in pursuing a summer project involving the fields of immunology and cancer, and fortunately we have some ongoing research at that intersection in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Pitt, and um, in that 
regard, um, I want to recognize Dr. Shimwa Lu and Dr. Lu Jia Chen, who were also primary men, uh, co-mentors of Jasmine this summer. Um, Dr. Lu provided uh, conceptual guidance in the project, and Dr. Chen also provided conceptual guidance as well as mentoring about the application of state-of-the-art bioinformatics tools uh, to the data and 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 uh, that are related to and and also obtaining data related to cancer and immunology. Uh, Jasmine really did an outstanding uh, job on the project. Uh, she did extensive reading uh, about immunology, cancer, and uh, the field at their intersection. She learned uh, a lot about bioinformatics languages, um, including R, several software packages that she'll talk about. And, and she worked with Dr. Chen to apply them to an interesting data set um, in work that she'll be discussing in her presentation. So the title of her talk is Exploring Differential Communication Involving T-Cells in Colorectal Tumors in Normal Tissue. And uh, Jasmine, I'll uh, give you the, the floor and looking forward to your presentation. All right, let me just share my screen. All right, so as my mentor said before, the we did my project on exploring differential communication involving immuno cells and colorectal tumor and normal tissue. So over here, we have in the top corner, a tumor microenvironment, which is basically just the tissues and cells that make up a tumor. We have cells like T cells and myeloid cells, and then we have other cells like B cells, which are in here, but not mentioned in the photo. And specifically, my mentors and I studied cell to cell communication through ligand and receptors. How it works is there's a molecule called a ligand, and it's basically given from one cell to another cell through a receptor, and in turn, it creates a response in that cell. And we measured this using RNA sequencing, which gave us a closer look at individual cells and genes expressions and their levels for this ligand receptor pairs. So we use this RNA sequencing to analyze previously collected data from the source down here from 23 patients with colorectal cancer and from 10 of the 23 patients, we were able to get, or the project down here, was able to get normal tissue cells. And we identified the cell types from the data and clustered them using principal component analysis and a sewer rat package on R. And for the cells, we analyzed them using the single cell RNA sequencing data to measure their expression of genes for ligands and receptors. And we use cell chat to analyze everything from the RNA sequencing data. And yeah. So our hypothesis was that the communications amongst the cells in the microenvironment of normal tissue and colorectal cancer tissue will differ. Over here, we have a UMAP graph of the cell types. Each of these little dots, as you can see, is kind of like its own cell. And it's the cell that expressed B cells kind of performance. It's like a calculation, it's not exact, but it's the cells that express the most B cell behavior or the mast cells over in the green or the epithelial myeloids. And then we have stromals and T cells. And then over here, we have the cells separated by class, whether they were tumor in pink or, or tumor in blue and normal in pink. And my mentors and I noticed that the top three tumor infiltrating cells were the epithelial cells over here, the stromal cells right in the middle, and the T cells that are right on top. Now this right here is the is a table that shows the numerical values for each of the cell ligand receptor expression levels or the strength of their communication. Up at the top, we have it separated into normal tissue and tumor tissue. And we have each of the rows separated into ligands like B cell ligands or epithelial cell ligands or mast cell ligands. And the top we have the receptors, which are the B cell receptors, epithelial cell receptors, and so on. 
and it's the same for both graphs. And the number right here is basically like the strength or expression level for each individual cell ligand pair. And usually it ranges from zero to about one, sometimes more, sometimes less, you know? <laughs> now here we have the T cell, as you can see, it's 0.34 in the normal tissue. And then down here, you can see it kind of drops to 0.06. And then we have the mass to T cell communication, which is 1.17 and then it drops to zero. And then we have epithelial cells and you can see that it's 0.089 in the normal tissue, but then in the tumor tissue, you can see that it rises to a 1.03. And then you can see the epithelial to B cell communication is 0.094. And then it also rises to a 0.245. Right here, we have a chord chart that shows the cell communication strength. The thicker the line is, the stronger the communication strength. And it's basically going from this cell right here to where the arrows point, which is like a one-way communication pathway. And as you can see, this line right here in the normal tissue is pretty thick, meaning it has pretty good communication compared to like these other cells. But then if you look at the same line, when the cells are in tumor tissue, you can see that it's not as strong, which is exactly what the graph before showed, that the T cell, the T cell communication is stronger in normal tissue. Here we have the same graph, but showing it from the stromal cells perspective, you can see that it's pretty evenly spaced out between the stromal cell communication with other cells. But then you can see with this stromal cell to epithelial cell communication in the normal tissue, it's a lot weaker than the stromal cell to epithelial cell communication in the tumor tissue. And then the same thing goes for stromal cell to stromal cell communication in the normal and tumor tissues. Now here is the epithelial cells. It's a little bit harder to tell how strong the communication pathway is because they're so similar, but you can kind of see with the epithelial cells to epithelial cell communication and the epithelial to B cell communication that the epithelial cells in the tumor tissue communicate better in the tumor tissue. You can see that the line here is thicker and then the line with the B cells just a little bit thicker here. And here's the mast cell, which I found pretty interesting because in the normal tissue, it only has three actual connections. And the strongest connection is the T cells. And then it has the meloid and epithelial cells. But then if you look in the tumor tissue, there aren't really any connections, which you would think means that the mast cell has no real communication with the other cells, but that's not the case because these graphs only show the ligand receptor pairs communication, which suggests that the mast cells have some other form of communication that they use besides just ligand receptor pairs. Now, in summary, the ligand receptor gene expression in a particular cell can be found through single cell RNA sequencing. The strength of communication between each cell type varies depending on whether or not the cells are situated in tumor or normal tissue. You can tell this because of the differences between the mast cells and the other cells, which suggests higher complication in mast cell communication. And the T cell to T cell over here in the mast to T cell communication was stronger in normal tissue, while stromal to epithelial and epithelial to epithelial cell communication was stronger in the tumor tissue. Further study of cell-cell communication could help us better understand why and how tumor cells affect intracellular communication and could also help to reveal those communication channels that are beneficial or deleterious to tumor growth. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? So great job, Jasmine. So let's let's unmute or turn our cameras on and give her a round of applause. 
great work. Any questions? So Jasmine, I found it, I know you were focusing on immune cells. I found it incredibly interesting at the dramatic increase of communication from stromal cells to epithelial cells in the tumors. I think that's it's kind of astounding of how big of a jump it is, uh, you know, from very close to zero to one, essentially. Um, it might speak to, I think, maybe in a, what we already know as the stromal cell's important role in driving epithelial cell division, which is the, the cancer cells. Um, I'm wondering, have you, what, what, if you had an infinite amount of time, I know we had such a very small amount of time this summer, only eight weeks. Is there something now that you've done this project that you would have liked to do or would do in the future or things based on your results that you would like to, you know, go and, and read papers on it? So what are you thinking if you had, again, an infinite amount of time would have been your future directions or what have kind of sparked your interest going forward? Um, in this project, I definitely found the mast cells the most interesting thing to look at. And since we didn't have a lot of time to like discover, I definitely would have liked to like in future, in the future, look at the mast cells and see what form of communication they kind of use if it's not the ligand receptor form. Excellent. Yeah, I know almost nothing about mast cells. So that would be interesting for me to learn about too. So very good. Any other questions for Jasmine? If not, Jasmine, again, great job. Congratulations. Again, another um, congratulations to all of the, the speakers, the students and their mentors who in session two, who all did an absolutely phenomenal job. So congratulations to all of you. Uh, at this time, we are going to take our second break. Uh, so we'll start the break now and we'll come back on time for session three, which is set to start at 1155. So if you can come back maybe a minute early, we'll start that third session on time. But again, another congratulations to the students and mentors of sessions one and two. Congratulations. Now let's go take a break. Thank you.
<clears throat> Hi, everyone. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. And welcome back to the third and final session of uh, the Cosby and Friends group uh, here today. Uh, and we're, again, we're going to jump right into presentations to stay on time. Uh, our next speaker, I apologize, you hear a dog barking in the background. Our next speaker is a returning student, Eduardo, who worked with uh, Uma and Uma's group. So I see Uma here and Will. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Uma or Will to, to introduce Eduardo. It's been a pleasure working with Eduardo. Actually, Alex Chang in my group is going to do the introduction, who mentored him quite oh, a bit. There's Alex too. I didn't yeah. see his name. Great. Yeah. Go ahead, Alex. Alex. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Alex Chang. I'm an analyst with Dr. Uma Chandra's lab, we mentored Eduardo Ramirez, who will be presenting next. Uh, Eduardo's project was very challenging in the sense that there were limited data sets uh, that we could rely on because of minimal data set availability and differentiation of methodologies between projects. So, however, Eduardo was very patient as he tried to go through multiple data sets and doing multiple analyses to find something interesting to present to you all today. He worked very independently, reading papers, writing code. So we are impressed with what he was able to come up with. And we hope that you are just as impressed as we are. So I'll give it over to Eduardo. Now. Thank you for that. Uh, my project is a comprehensive transcriptomic and meta-analysis to characterize the host immune responses in SARS-CoV-2 infections. To begin, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection has caused the coronavirus 2019 pandemic, or in other words, the COVID-19 pandemic we're living in. SARS-CoV-2's host immune response has been the subject of many research studies and is not quite understood although other SARS-CoVs and coronaviruses have existed. What is known, however, can be seen in the figure on the right, that the spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptor in synergy with TMP RSS2 in order to release the virus into the host cytoplasm. So from this, we proposed a research question. We aim to characterize the transcriptome changes in SARS-CoV-2 infections. We look to answer the following questions. What are the differentially expressed genes? What pathways are perturbed? What is the host immune response? And if this immune response is dependent on comorbidities? Therefore, our methodology was the following. We first went on the gene expression omnibus and inputted the following search queries, SARS-CoV-2, COVID, COVID RNA-seq, and then we retrieved the data set if bulk RNA seq was used. We then performed differential expression analysis on all the data sets using edge R. Then, on a select number of data sets with their GOIDs um, seen in the middle, we did the following pathway analysis using ingenuity pathway analysis or IPA, immune cell deconvolution using Cybersort X and Estimate as well as meta-analysis using Illumina's correlation engine. What we find from our methodology is that SARS-CoV-2 geodatasets lack rigor and reproducibility. Due to the SARS-CoV-2 field being very new, it is difficult to do meta-analysis as many studies do not have enough details. Many geo studies also follow different methods which make it difficult to reproduce results. Another finding of ours is that SARS-CoV-2 related uh, search queries have by far much fewer um, data sets found than other diseases, for example, cancer seen right below it on the right. And now because of this, we focus on one main study, Desire All Nature 2020. This study consisted of RNA-seq analysis of various tissues. These tissues can be pictured below on the left. One insightful thing from this study is that they were able to characterize the SARS-CoV-2 infected population into three different subpopulations, vir virus high, virus low, and virus mixed. They did this for the lungs, and we used the same, um, <clears throat> the same groups in our study. 
What we find from separating the SARS-CoV-2 infected population into different viral loads is that there are varying immune responses. Present in figure A, we see that there are different box plot distributions for each vir virus population. Now, we look to estimate, um, we used estimate immune scores for this. In order to cross validate our results, we used Excel immune scores. We plotted the correlation, which can be seen in figure B, and we see that there is a positive correlation in our favor, validating our results. We also look to see what was driving this change in immune responses. What we find is that inflammatory responses are dependent on SARS-CoV-2 viral loads. Present in figure A, we see that there is by far a much larger cell fraction of um, M1 macrophages in the virus high group. Meanwhile, in figure B, we see that there is by far much fewer M2 macrophages in virus high when compared to the other groups. Now, there is something called cytokine storm. Cytokine storm occurs when there is a large pro-inflammatory response with an insufficient anti-inflammatory response. This is important to know as M1 macrophages release inflammatory cytokines, meanwhile M2 macrophages release anti-inflammatory cytokines. Um, and what we see present could be a possible case of cytokine storm, which can lead to organ damage. Now, performing downstream pathway analysis reveals that there is perturbance in significant pathways. In IPA and GO analysis of our healthy versus high differentially expressed genes, this reveals that there is immune-related pathway dysregulation present. This can be seen in figure A where there is a large amount of uh, differentially expressed genes that correspond to inflammation mediated by chemokine and cytokine signaling pathways. This is consistent with our last slide, which shows that there is inflammation in the virus high population. Another finding of ours is that NUT16 is a top differentially expressed gene involved in lipid metabolism. Interestingly, Wei et al.'s findings discover cholesterol biosynthesis pathways to be required host factors for SARS-CoV-2 infection. We also perform meta-analysis in order to validate our results. After meta-analysis using correlation engine, we discover that SARS-CoV-2 resembles other viral infections of the lung. This can be present in figure A and figure B, where there are correlated diseases such as influenza, um, viral carditis um, present, as well as in figure B, where there are skin inflammation responses from uh, dermatomyositis, and as well as oxygen treatment of premature infants with very low birth weights. Now we dive further into this and looked at the common host responses present. And what we see that is common is the activation of the interferon signaling pathway. This pathway has a critical role in human immune response as it releases interferons. Interferons by their name interfere with viral proliferation and are therefore needed to fight viruses. In summary, immune responses in SARS-CoV-2 infections have a correlation with viral load. Inflammatory responses present in SARS-CoV-2 infections are dependent on the viral load. SARS-CoV-2 infections most likely affect lipid pathways. SARS-CoV-2 shares features of other viral infections of the lung as well. For future studies, it would be possible to do more detailed studies such as in different comorbidities. Single cell RNA-seq will also help unveil important features of the viral infection as well as experimentally finding SARS-CoV-2 pathways will help discover drug targets. And I'd like to acknowledge and thank Dr. Boone and Solomon for the opportunity to be part of the Hillman Academy. I'd also like to thank Dr. Chandran, Alex, Vishal, and Will for the valuable mentorship. And this project was supported through funds from PIT DBMI and 
NCI's YES program. Great job, Eduardo. <clears throat> nice to see you back presenting again. Good work. Can we give him a, a round of applause either through unmuting or video? Excellent job. Any questions for Eduardo? So Eduardo, I have, I have questions um, and I, I apologize, I may have missed this. I thought it was a very clear presentation. I really liked it. Uh, the samples that are actually being sequenced in the, in the studies that you used, what are the samples? Are they from spit, from blood, from tissue? Uh, what were the samples that were being sequenced? Um, so on our select number of data sets, it was a variety. It could be placenta, blood, lung, um, and other um, tissues. However, in our focal study, um, it consisted as well as of a variety of tissues, but we focused on only the infected lungs and healthy lungs. Great. Yeah. So that's, that complicates things when it's coming from different tissues, which I'm sure are some of the struggles that you had uh, with the limited data sets too. Uh, so that's great. Were any of the data sets you used linked also to clinical data, like outcome data, hospitalization, severe COVID, um, mortality? Is there any connections you can make between some of the analyses you did, whether it be pathway analysis or differential expression, and connect it to clinical features? I mean, I, I know you did high viral load, um, and, I, and I assume that's probably one of the clinical features, but are there others that were common among the studies? Um, many of these studies came from autopsy samples. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but regarding uh, length of disease and everything, that was not provided to us. Okay, that makes sense. Any other questions for Eduardo? If not, Eduardo, great job. Uh, thanks again and congratulations to you and, and to Uma and Will and Alex, uh, really nice work. All right. And for our uh, next presentation, uh, I believe it might be a video of, um, it's coming from both uh, Destiny and Tobias, and Dr. Rich Boyce is the one who will introduce them. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Rich. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, sound good. Okay, uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce two students I've had the, had, got to work with the last, uh, the summer. Uh, the first student, Tobias Baker, uh, who is not able to make it and who did prepare a video uh, today is a recent graduate with honors from Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf and an incoming freshman to Pitt. Uh, Tobias participated in Hillman Academy last summer and returned this summer to build on the project that was started last year. Tobias is a very talented, curious, hardworking student, with a strong interest in computer science and biology. And I've really enjoyed mentoring Tobias in the program. I'm proud of the hard work and effort Tobias has put into the program and I'm real excited about Tobias' future. So the video presentation will uh, show the introduction to the project, methods, and then Destiny, who I'm gonna introduce now, will take over and summarize the project results. Destiny is an honor roll student and rising senior at Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf, a student who is very interested uh, uh, in science, so much so that when we first presented the program uh, at Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf a few years ago, she expressed a desire to enter it, uh, but couldn't because she was in eighth grade at the time. So we were so excited when she came in. She's a quick learner, inquisitive, a strong leader, well-organized, maintains a very positive attitude, and then is also very good at balancing school and extracurricular activities, including her love for volleyball, and she serves as secretary for the student body class of 2021. So I've enjoyed mentoring Destiny in the program, answering a lot of the insightful questions that she brings up, and I hope she returns next year when we have the ability to place students in wet labs. So as I said, Destiny will be a part of two presentations. She helped Tobias uh, to acquire some results, and we'll be presenting those. 
And then she worked with a co-mentor, uh, a, a student who's a PhD student named Lin Huang. And she'll talk about the work that she did with Lin in a full presentation. So with that introduction, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen and show the video that Tobias prepared, and then I'll stop it and uh, we'll have Destiny share her uh, screen with the same slide deck up and, uh, and she'll communicate the rest of those results and then she'll go right into her presentation. So there won't be another round of introductions at that point. Does that sound okay? Okay, we'll give it a try. So um, here we go. And uh, do you see the, the video getting ready to queue up? We do. Okay. And interpreter, let me know if it's running too fast. I'll slow it down. Um, it was a little bit long, so I'm running it just slightly quicker than how it was oh recorded. It okay. automatically connects. Yeah, okay. unfortunately, I was unable to make it today to the actual Zoom meeting, so I decided to pre-record this presentation. So it's better than nothing, right? So I am Tobias Baker, a freshman at the University of Pittsburgh. I'll be attending there this upcoming fall. Hopefully, I'll see some of you there eventually. I've been working with Dr. Richard Boyce for the past two years. And this is my second year with the Hillman Academy program. Hopefully, I'll be working with you guys later on in years. I'm also working with a student from Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf. Um, she's a senior currently, Destiny Mendel, and she's been working with me for this summer. She'll be presenting alongside with me today as well. The topic that we've worked on for the past seven weeks is improving a novel tool to help high school age students who are deaf or hard of hearing, generally ninth through 12th grade, to understand biological terminology better. So a little bit of background information. To begin with, I'll be explaining a lot of things related to the deaf community. The deaf and hard of hearing people who would be interested in doing STEM related fields is an extremely rare occasion. Deaf people who do STEM and bioinformatics are extremely underrepresented. There's only 7% of the deaf and hard of hearing people who already received their masters in the STEM field, only 7%. Imagine that alongside the hearing community, the hearing people in this field are at a much higher possibility. 12.1%. So you can see the difference here. The deaf and the hearing should be equal, right? But unfortunately, that isn't the case. We're trying to work on increasing the percentage of deaf working in the STEM field by doing this project. Why? We, want, we need more of the representation as deaf individuals. There are deaf people out there doing things, doing other things, but where's the deaf in the STEM field? We need more deaf scientists, deaf engineers, etc. This kind of representation is very valuable to our community because of how small it is. It's very valuable with deaf youth. Yes, deaf people are visual learners. We perceive everything with our own eyes every day. How do we learn through our eyes? We tend to learn visually by using images, charts, diagrams, and other visual aids that allow us to understand the context better. Our own language, American Sign Language, is very visual as well, allowing us to visually communicate with others this way. Unfortunately, we face barriers daily. It is very common in the deaf community. Not only the deaf, but anyone who's in the minority scenario. It could be people with disabilities and other types of people as well. We face a lot of discrimination and a lot of barriers that prevent us from communicating our needs towards people. The three main points of why barriers occur are a lack of self-advocacy, accommodations, and a lack of a support system. Not many students know how to self-advocate. And I was fortunate that WPSD has taught me how to do so. I learned that I had to speak up for what I needed, not just to sit back when things go bad, I have to use my voice. Again, I'm truly lucky that WPSD has taught me that lesson. The second point is accommodations. We as deaf people need them to be able to understand what's going on. For instance, we have interpreters speaking for us and translating us for us on this call today. We're fortunate to have them to help us communicate. They're one of the key parts of communication access. 
it doesn't have to be interpreters, but they can be transcriptions or closed captions. It varies for each deaf individual. It doesn't have to be the same for everyone. Our support systems, like parents, teachers, staff, can be either good or bad. Sometimes when it comes to the public school environment, having one doesn't always have to be good. For me, having that experience, it was not so good due to them not understanding how to provide for me and how to provide communication with me as a deaf individual. Some are fortunate, some aren't. In general, most of the support systems that we have aren't as much due to our hearing loss. Our hypothesis, um, the general hypothesis that we have is that we can use information technology such as AI, artificial intelligence, or a website tool to connect English concepts, vocabulary, language, and the written material to help deaf and hard of hearing students to understand the context better. So we did some work for the last two years when I was with Dr. Richard Boyce. We established an aid and applied them to two websites, YouTube and Wikipedia. We established the aid because our language, American Sign Language, is not a written and English-based language. We used key aspects of words, not every single words, in one sentence. For example, in English, translating to ASL, you would say, in English, you would say red dress. In ASL, you would sign dress and then sign red. So you see that it's swapped, right? We tend to do that to help us understand it better. We use simpler syntax. So that's what this aid is for, to help the students understand the scientific terminology better alongside with our primary language. You can see that we have two different images. I'm gonna start with the one on the left. It's a Wikipedia page. We applied the tool on that website and we analyzed and took some words from the web page for the tool to use. Then the tool will be able to detect the words that are embedded in the system. It is separated into two different categories though, English terms and scientific terms. The yellow is scientific and the blue or purple, depends on how your computer screen sees the color, would be the English terms. So what does this tool do? When you click on a highlighted word, a pop-up will appear. There are two separate areas, a video and a slideshow. You will be seeing either me or someone else signing the term and providing an example sentence. On the opposite side, you'll see the definition or a picture to explain it. The pictures will aid the students alongside the video because we are visual learners and our goal is to be able to visually aid the student to understand it better. The same concept goes for the YouTube videos, except that it has closed captions. You can pause the videos and once you click on the highlighted words, you'd see the similar pop-up that appears. It would be the same concept as the Wikipedia page. The idea of our entire project is, try, is to try and recruit 15 to 20 deaf or hard of hearing students that have a primary language of American Sign Language. And they'd have to have a minimum of a slight hearing loss that affects them all the way to profound deafness. It doesn't matter what stage of life they got deaf, as long as ASL is their primary language. And then for our methodology, we plan to conduct a pilot within subjects user study of the tool. So we will have three different types of subjects in the entire experiment. Each person will be receiving the tool in a subject, but it will be varied. For example, the first person will be getting the tool assistance in the second subject, but the rest of them will be unassisted. The same goes for the second, we'll be getting the tool in the first subject, but won't be getting assistance for the rest. The third person will be getting assistance in the last subject, but not for the first two. 
we will be conducting a pre-test and a post-test. And in between, we provide either a YouTube video or a Wikipedia page, either the tool assistance or no tool assistance. And the interpreter is just letting Tobias finish with that explanation. So this summer we piloted the study. We practiced verbally um, and signing the procedure scripts to each other. The practice actually helped a lot and gained us confidence. We asked some volunteers who were willing to provide us feedback with the tool to see if it was compatible and to see if it was clear and understandable. We're trying to make it compatible on any types of operating systems and types of web, brow web browsers. We're testing out the tool on Firefox, Safari, and Google Chrome but we're trying to figure out how to apply it to all materials. Some students will not be able to have computers or some schools will not be able to afford laptops. So now I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Destiny Mandel. Like I said, she's a senior at Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf. Thank you for having me and have a great day. All right, so first we're gonna talk about um, the results for this project. Um, so we were able to get two high school participants in this study. We collected data on issues the participants had as well as their feedback. So if you look here, you can see the tool, the toolbox that was used and that was on these wiki pages and videos that we had the participants use. So the study procedure consisted of a pretest, and then the wiki page or video with the tool assistance, followed by a post test. As we're doing this, we went over feedback. Um, we observed things, and this is what some issues we figured out. First, we couldn't close the video after clicking on the tool. So since it's not preferred, they would like the video to be gone. Um, the video was too small, so a large size is preferred. Um, some of the terms that were highlighted for visual systems were too easy for the participants, as well as repetitive. We feel that more terms should have been added to the tool because one of the participants, they, they seemed like they were trying to click on a word, but it wasn't highlighted. So we feel like we need to add more um, highlighted words 
as well as the toolbox was still visible, even if the page didn't have the highlighted terms. So that was a little bit confusing to, to the participants. So these are our results. They're on slide. So they're on this slide and they're as well as on this slide. Um, we are able to get two participants, as like I said before. And the very different results. Like if you look here, you have too much inconsistency. Some said somewhat agree and others said strongly degree. Um, system was unnecessary complex, some was neutral, some was like somewhat degree, as well as even how Cooper some this project says somewhat degree, neutral. You needed to learn a lot to use the system. Someone went somewhat agree, and the other person said strongly degree. So we definitely need more participants to make a conclusion. So right now, the only conclusion we have is that this system is not perfect. But what we discussed is that we do have a stable tool and study protocol that has been tested, but we still need small improvements before proceeding and continuing with the study. Um, you'll need a good experience in user entered software design, as well as a user study. And we'll just go through the requirements design as well as testing. And at the end, we'd just like to thank any former participants. Um, Haley, she was actually the first student to work on this project. This project's been going around for three, four years. As well as we'd like to thank the interpreters. I know Caleb's interpreting for me right now, so thank you. And Max Silva, which is the programmer who designed this tool and web page. Um, Dr. Bar Barbara, I'm sorry, I'm horrible at pronouncing names. She was the deaf scientist who came to our meeting. And then we have Salm, as well as David Boone for having us in this program. So thank you as well. Okay. And that's that presentation. So. So would you like to take questions on that presentation now before going twice? So thank you, Destiny, for that presentation. It was excellent. Uh, and thanks for giving two talks. That's, uh, you know, incredible to do two different things. Would you like to take questions now for that presentation? Um, and then, yes. okay, then let's do that. So first of all, let's give you a round of applause for the first work and for Tobias, who unfortunately couldn't be here. So congratulations and good work. Any questions for for destiny. Trying to navigate my screens to see if there are any hands or chats. So, so destiny, I'll ask a question. So it, it's really exciting for me because I've seen this project grow from student to student uh, to see it's finally being tested, which is wonderful. So your participants that you had were these recruited from your school? Were they recruited randomly? How were they recruited? Um, we were just looking, one of the participants were from my school, the other participant wasn't. So just people we knew, any connections we had. Unfortunately, we had like a hard time getting participants because it's very hard to get teenagers to want to sit down in the computer and do a study in the summertime. <laughs> yes. So it was very difficult, but fortunately we were able to get two. So, yay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's great. And, you know, two is not a lot for you, like you, you know, rightly po pointed out to know exactly what the usability is, but it seems like you have some comments and feedback. Is that now being fed back to the programmer to make adjustments? Are, are you guys to that stage yet where there are definitely things that you want to change? I do not know the specifics of when that's going to happen, but that's definitely something that is going to happen because we need to do those changes before proceeding, <laughs> as we discussed. So, um, that is, um, uh, my name is Madhvi. I'm a professor here. So, uh, talking about participants, um, you know, the first time I've interacted with um, some of the, you know, the students who are developing this, it sort of opened our eyes to how much less science is accessible and now we are getting educated about how we should make sure that science is accessible to everybody and uh, i am familiar with many high school students who want to uh, you know 
contribute to or, uh, you know aspects like this. So if there are other students um, in other other schools and so on, is there um, is there something that they can contribute towards this work? Like you said, participants, right? So would you need uh, students to be participating from other schools? Um, yes, we, we are trying to just get as many participants as possible. Um, we are reaching out to other schools that are full of deaf and hard of hearing students. The only like requirement is that um, ASL is the primary language and that's it. Um, okay. Does that answer your question? So there are, there are some, uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, maybe, Anyway, so uh, so I think uh, I don't know uh, whether ASL is primary language, but I know that there are some students who can understand ASL. Um, so I'll I'll reach out to you. But it's really excellent work. I'm so happy to see the progress on this year by year. Okay. Your voice is off. You're muted. I can't hear you, David. S sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I was just saying that, that uh, again, congratulations, Destiny. We'll wrap up questions for this talk now, and we'll allow you to roll right into your next question since, again, our speaker needs no introduction because she was just introduced. So, Destiny, go ahead and, and tell us a little bit about the research that you did with uh, Rich and Lynn this summer. Hi, um, so I'll just bring up that presentation. Hi, can everyone see the presentation? So I worked with Richard and Lynn on the study, annotation study of biomedical papers to support clinical study assessment quality. So we're starting with evidence synthesis, which is the process of collecting and integrating information from science literature to answer a clinical question. This ensures that the treatment decisions are based on only the best information available from the literature and not only on a traditional and provider experience. So for evidence synthesis process, that contains four main steps. The first one is to ask and formulate a clinical question. The second is to find the relevant clinical studies from the biomedical literature to acquire the evidence. And the third is to assess evidence from the studies for their quality. And the fourth is to synthesize the evidence to answer the original clinical question. What I'm focusing on is to assess the evidence from the studies for their quality. This is the process of carefully and systematically examining a clinical study through its published paper in order to assess its qualities. This allows researchers to determine how much confidence they have in the outcomes of those studies. The quality of clinical studies can be assessed through two different aspects, starting with methodological quality as reporting quality. Methodological quality concerns, well, the clinical study and how was it designed and conducted, while reporting quality describes how transparently a clinical study is reported on paper, so by, published by Scientific Journal. So a methodological study is the study being designed and conducted and reporting quality is the paper being reported and published. The whole goal of the study is to develop an information extraction system that could automatically identify and extract methodological characteristics from these clinical studies and can be used to assess methodological and reporting quality of these studies. So the information extraction system is basically made to pull out the important information. So we know Google, Google's very good at finding information, but it's not really good at pulling out the important information. So that's what this system is trying to do. This would be great for clinicians, systematic reviewers, guideline developers, and quality improvement designers. 
So for our task, I need to prepare data that can develop the information extraction system. My task was an annotation task. I had to annotate 50 biomedical papers, which is roughly 2,500 sentences. And I had to look at these sentences and identify the methodological characteristics and annotate the text. So we have to annotate the text because we need to train the system. We need to teach the system. And therefore, therefore these papers have to be annotated humanly. And then, so, the, so once we train the system, then the system will be able to identify all of these important factors and methodological characteristics. The annotation software that I used for this task was BRAT. I had to annotate nine methodological characteristics and the characteristics of randomization genera generation, binding methods, and trial design. So if you look here, this is kind of an example of what the annotation file looks like. So we have block, we have the block size, so blocks of four, we have the ratio, and because it has a block size, you can infer that it is block randomization. To do this, we followed an annotation guideline, which characteristics the which defines the characteristics of the annotate. So if you look here, this is an example of blinding. So it tells me the definition, um, the different types of blinding, and as well as the definition of those. And then this is the information shown in BRAT. So I will basically highlight any important important text like you've seen in the previous slide. I would click on uh, double blinded, for example, go to the blinding method and be able to click double blinded. The results of this, 30 of the 50 papers were annotated. 43.3% of the papers reported trial design. 90% of the papers reported randomization generation and 86.6% of the papers reported a blinding method. Out of all the papers reported, at least either, re either reported a randomization generation or a blinding method, but oftentimes they did not report the trial design. So this is what I used to show my results from the study. So if I found it, it was just shown right here, as you can see, trial design, the blinding randomization generation, and then the blinding method. And these are all the different papers. And then these are any notes I had while I was taking it. In conclusion, again, we did 30 out of the 50 papers in our data set. We improved the annotation guideline with new insights from annotation, like how much text should be annotated. For example, oftentimes it won't just say double blinded. It will say this information was masked from the participants and the researchers. So I would just highlight that information. I wouldn't highlight the whole sentence. And then future work would be finishing the remaining 20 papers, as well do an agreement analysis with other annotators' annotations. So when this is all done, um, Lynn and the other annotator and another annotator, they're just gonna come in and they're going to talk about, they're gonna compare and then come to a common ground. And because they need good, they just need, they need like a final draft basically, good results. And then they'll use that to train the system. Again, um, acknowledgements. I already said thank you to some, but I'll just say thank you again. Um, so Dr. Halle, I think I said that right, and the PhD student candidate Lynn from School of Information Sciences, Sciences UIUC, uh, which she was my mentor for this project. Um, really appreciate her. Um, Dr. Richard Boyce, even though he wasn't my mentor for this project, he helped me practice and he was he was helpful to answer any extra questions I had. Again, <laughs> thanks to the interpreters. And thanks again to David and Saul for this program. Great, great job. So again, give her a round of applause. Good work, Destiny. Oh, thank you. So two quite different projects that you were involved in this summer. Uh, any questions for this project oh, for Destiny? Yes. Uh, 
So Destiny, I, and I apologize if I missed this. So for your annotation, you're doing 50 papers. Mm -hmm. How did you decide which 50 papers that you were going to review? Um, there wasn't any like specific pick and choose. We just kind of went down in order. So I had 50 papers. I just started with the first one and worked from there and we were able to finish 30. Okay, so it was a list that was given to you. You don't know if they're, the reason why I ask is obviously if we choose 50 random papers, they might not all have trials or blinding or randomization in them. So I'm guessing there must have been some reason you wanted to use these papers to create, which I think you're essentially doing a gold standard so that you can test models on, on later. Uh, so I was just curious of, of if there are specific types of clinical trials. So from your reading, I mean, reading 30 papers is a lot. From your reading of these 30 papers, are there any commonalities between them? Um, the most common thing, most of them were related to um, me medicine. Like this medicine was given to this um, patient, this one was given to this participant and they were comparing. Um, so that was like the most common thing. Another thing that was common they were also have like separate like subtitles for like blinding, but they would say masking and um, randomization generation. But oftentimes trial design would just be like overlooked. It was just like, it just wasn't shown. So that, that was something that was very repetitive, I guess you would say. And that's interesting for papers that are probably talking about clinical trials for them not to discuss it well. Mm -hmm. Very good. Any other questions for Destiny? If not, great work, Destiny. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. So our uh, next speaker is, is someone that I will introduce. So Taylor Moniz had the unfortunate mispleasure of working with me this year. Uh, and uh, Dr. Becky Waters, who's my colleague and friend, um, on a project that, that she did amazingly well. Taylor is a returning student she was actually here in 2019. So pre-COVID, when things were normal, she got to experience the program fully. She was able to stay in the dorms. Uh, she's a native Hawaiian, so she lives in Hawaii, so she had to stay in the dorms. This year, she's just working six hours different than us all of the time. So it's been waking up very early in the morning uh, to, to work with us uh, throughout the whole year. Um, and, and when she was here in 2019, she worked in wet labs, is one of the first students who were part of the YES program decided last summer to, I think, stay local and work in wet labs still instead of doing a computational work. But we were finally able to drag her back and drag her to the dark side of trying computational work. Um, she's been, she's, she's already graduated high school uh, and she's starting in the fall in a joint program at Columbia and Trinity College in Dublin. So she'll be moving overseas uh, very shortly uh, where she is probably gonna study neurobiology. So. I brought her in and did not study neurobiology, did not do wet lab, and we did computational work in, in some genomics and cancer. Uh, but it's been an absolute pleasure to work with Taylor. She's been so fun to work with, is incredibly, incredibly intelligent and driven and independent, which are all necessary because, again, we are working in this six-hour time zone difference. I was amazed at how quickly she picked up coding. This is the first time she ever coded, uh, I think. Uh, it's definitely the first time she ever coded in R, and she picked it up just incredibly quickly. Uh, and really drove this project and just asked me questions along the way, is very inquisitive and is always uh, seemingly happy and just a pleasure to work with. So, so Taylor, thank you so much for all the work you've done this summer. Um, and and I'll, I'll turn it over to you to give your talk. Okay, um, thank you for that very nice introduction, Dr. Boone. Um, like you said, my name is Taylor. Um, and my project this summer studied the sonic hedgehog pathway in bone metastases of breast cancer. So bone metastases is the most common site of metastases for breast cancer. And bone metastases were found to seriously affect the quality of life of cancer patients. And it remains the main cause of morbidity in cancer patients in general. Um, and unfortunately, the five-year survival rate for breast cancer patients with bone metastases is only 20 to 30%. So only 20 to 30% of patients with bone metastases will live past five years. Um, Dr. Waters and her team focused on finding actionable genes for treating bone metastases of breast cancer. And she found in her preliminary research 
that patch one was a potentially actionable gene for bone metastases. So her figure that she published is on the left. Um, it shows that 45% of the paired cases that she looked at um, had upregulation of patched one. The figure on the right was made by me, and that plotted our expanded data set, um, the, the patch one expression for our expanded data set. So on the left, you see the bone metastases, and on the right, you see the primary tumors. Um, you can see that there is upregulation of patch one in the bone metastases. So that inspired us to look at the sonic hedgehog pathway, um, because if you look at the diagram on the right, um, patched one is the receptor for sonic hedgehog in the sonic hedgehog pathway. So it plays a critical role in the sonic hedgehog pathway. So sonic hedgehog overexpression was found to promote tumor growth and metastasis. And sonic hedgehog overexpression is also associated with poor survival and poor prognosis. Um, and it's also very important that sonic hedgehog is clinically actionable. So there are multiple drugs that target the sonic hedgehog pathway. The majority of them are shown here. They target smoothened um, because in the sonic hedgehog pathway, patched one is a receptor for patch, or sorry, patched one is a receptor for sonic hedgehog, um, which stops um, SUFU from binding to GLE1, which allows GLE1 to relocate to the nucleus and become activated. So it is a clinically actionable pathway and one that we wanted to look at for this study. That, oh, that leads me to my hypothesis. Um, the so we want to see if the sonic hedgehog pathway is upregulated in bone mets of breast cancer in comparison to their primary tumors. This is my research process. It started with an extensive literature search for gene signatures for the sonic hedgehog pathway. So ideally, we wanted a gene signature that showed what genes are being upregulated or downregulated by sonic hedgehog in breast cancer. Um, and we couldn't find that exact signature. We couldn't find a perfect signature. So I decided on three signatures that were sort of what we wanted and um, did gene set variation analysis for all three signatures. So I ran gene set variation analysis on two data sets. So the first data set was what Dr. Waters used for her preliminary studies, um, which consists of paired RNA sequences. So it had 20 mets, 20 primary, one met and one primary came from the same patient, which is why they're paired. And we expanded upon that data set and added an additional eight mets and three primary tumors. Um, so it's no longer paired, um, but we could expand that data set. Um, and like I said, I ran gene set variation analysis with three signatures I found in my literature search on my 51 samples. And then I wanted to expand further. So we looked at CCLE data, which is the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia Project, um, which is publicly available RNA sequences from 1,379 cell lines. Um, and we wanted to see if sonic hedgehog was also upregulated in bone cancer in comparison to breast cancer because that would tell us that something is happening in the bone rather than something is happening in the actual bone mets. So I also ran gene set variation analysis with that CCLE data. These are the results of my literature search. I decided upon three signatures that were kind of what we wanted. They're, none of them are perfect. Um, so the first one is a sonic hedgehog gene signature. Um, in this paper, they added the sonic hedgehog ligand to mouse neural cells, and the results were the top 30 upregulated genes and the top 30 downregulated genes. Um, this is not perfect because it's mouse cells, um, neural cells, not breast cancer cells, but it does encapsulate the entire pathway, what is being upregulated by the sonic hedgehog pathway, or up and down regulated by the sonic hedgehog pathway. The second signature I chose was a GLE1 G signature. The thing about this pathway, or sorry, this signature was that it was actually in breast cells, it was in MCF7 cells. So it was what genes were being up and down regulated by GLE1 in MCF7 cells. Um, like I said earlier, GLE1 is a critical part of the sonic hedgehog pathway. Um, sonic hedgehog activates GLE1, so we wanted to see what was being up and down regulated by GLE1 expression. So that signature has 12 up and 12 down genes. 
And I also looked at IPA, which is Ingenuity Pathway Analysis, to find my third signature. And that signature consisted of the actual genes within the sonic hedgehog pathway. Um, so Ingenuity Pathway Analysis had a sonic hedgehog pathway in their software. And I just extracted the genes that are in that pathway to create another gene signature. So those are like all of the genes you see here and maybe a more detailed schematic of the sonic hedgehog pathway. So, oops, okay. So I ran GSVA on all three of my gene signatures. Um, on the left, we see the sonic hedgehog gene signature. The center is the Glee 1G signature. And on the right, that's the IPA actual sonic hedgehog pathway gene signature. And we see the same trend across all three gene signatures which shows why we needed to look at multiple gene signatures because none of them are perfect, but luckily we see all the same trends. Um, this trend towards increased sonic hedgehog expression in bone mets in comparison to primary tumors. And when we looked at the CCLE data, we saw the same trend in bone cancer in comparison to breast cancer. So the figure on the left shows patch one expression for um, all of the 35 different primary types. So the Y at, or sorry, the X axis shows all the different primary types of cancer, like sarcomas, brain cancer, colorectal cancer, and they're all plotted here. Um, this box shows bone cancer, and this is breast. So we can see significantly higher patch one expression in bone than in breast. And we see the same trend when I ran gene set variation analysis on the CCLE data. So bone cancer higher than breast cancer. Oops, I keep skipping slides. Okay, um, in summary, gene signature GSVA results showed that sonic hedgehog trends towards being upregulated in bone in comparison to their breast cancer primary tumors. Um, and when I did the same thing in CCLE data, shows that there's higher sonic hedgehog activity in bone cancer in comparison to breast cancer cell lines, um, which tells us that sonic hedgehog could be upregulated in bone, possibly due to the bone microenvironment or sonic hedgehog upregulation in normal bone cells. Um, so we, could, we thought that there was possible contamination in the samples with normal bone cells, but we have no idea if sonic hedgehog is upregulated in normal bone cells. So immunohistochemistry or single cell RNA sequencing would need to be performed to determine if contamination occurred and if normal bone cells have high sonic hedgehog activity. I'd like to thank the, the Hillman Academy for having me back twice um, through the YES program, Solomon for everything, getting us paid and all of that stuff. Um, Dr. Boone for teaching me how to code. I had zero coding experience and I hated computational sciences because I'm not good at that stuff, but I learned a lot and I actually really enjoyed it. And Dr. Waters for inspiring this project and helping me out along the way. I will take any questions. Great job, Taylor. Let's give her uh, also a round of applause. Excellent work. Any questions for Taylor? So Taylor, now that you've taken this dive in, yet yeah, you saying that you're not good at computational science is just not true, first of all, because you did an excellent job. Uh, I'm wondering, now that you've done this, do you think that this will be something that you might do again some other time? Or do you definitely, or did it teach you that you, yeah, wet lab is definitely where you wanna go. I like the wet lab, but I can see now how computational sciences can be used to supplement a wet lab project because um, we wouldn't have RNA sequences without wet lab work, um, but we can use CS to actually like take a deeper dive into what the data means. So I appreciate it. And I will definitely use R to make my figures from now on, <laughs> at least that, so. Excellent. I'm glad I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Any other questions for Taylor? I just wanted to say excellent work, Taylor, and it was a pleasure working with you. Thank you, guys. Okay. If there are no other questions, I know it's getting late in the day. We've been doing this for a long time. 
We're going to move on to our last talk, our last speaker. Uh, and uh, Neil is coming back again. He is an undergrad. So for those of the students, we've talked about the YES program. It's a high school program where you can come back two years in a row. Neil is part of the Doris Duke program, which allows you to come back as an undergrad and do work. So, uh, you know, Neil is coming back. He's been here now part of the program for several years, but I will turn it over. I don't know if Casey is on the line. I haven't checked. He worked with Natasha and Casey this summer. Yes. Hi, Casey. So I'll turn it over to Casey to introduce Neil. Okay. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Casey Hansen. Uh, I am a PhD candidate in Natasha Miskov Zipnov's lab. Um, I was one of the grad students Neil worked with this summer. Um, Neil had the challenge of learning not just one, uh, but two of our lab's tools, um, which, you know, usually learning one of them and creating a project with them is a summer project in its own. Uh, and he did this in addition to having to learn to code in Python, which is what these tools are written in. Um, and he rose to the occasion. He did it beautifully. And uh, he did such a good job. I consider him to be the only person who knows my tool as well as I do. Um, so I really look forward to uh, you all seeing his presentation on the work that he did this summer. I think you're muted, Neil. Of course. Uh, <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, um, thank you for the kind words, Casey and Dr. Boone. I'm so excited to be back for another summer with the Hillman Academy. Um, every year I've been here, it's been wonderful. And this year was no exception. So let me get started. So as Casey mentioned, I'm working in the Melody Lab with Dr. Miskov Zivanov and Casey. And my model, my project was to extend a model of glioblastoma multiform, GBM using two tools, violin and clarinet, both of which were developed by our lab. I'm a third year undergrad student at the University of Connecticut, rising third year, and I'm in the Doris Duke Undergrad Charitable Foundation, part of the Hillman Academy. So a little bit of introduction and background on glioblastoma. So GBM, or glioblastoma multiform, is classified as a grade four astrocytoma. It's a rare, aggressive, malignant stage four CNS tumor. And what that means is that it primarily arises in your central nervous system, so your brain or your spinal cord, but it generally arises already in its stage four form. And it makes up 15% of all primary brain tumors in older adults. And as I mentioned before, because it arises in its stage four form, it has a very low survival rate after five years, only around three to 7%. GBM is often graded via the presence or the lack of presence of one protein called isocitrate dehydrogenase. And these tumors are classified as either IDH positive or IDH mutant. And treatment for glioblastoma is generally end stage. It's symptomatic. Um, treatments involve surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and palliative care to ease those who may be suffering from end-stage cancers. So a few terms and acronyms that will be helpful. An LEE is a literature extracted event. Simply, that's just an event that we extract from a database online. A machine reading output or an LEE set or a reading set, that's just a collection of all of these literature extracted events put into one file. An event collaboration graph or an ECLG is I'll explain this more in detail when I show a few, but it's a diagram or a graph showing the connections between different nodes. And in my case, they have to be proteins or genes. And PMC is PubMed Central. That's where you find all your research papers. And here in the bottom right, I have a figure that shows a few papers going into this Turner, and it all comes out as one paper. And um, this prefaces an important first step of my project, which was collecting data. So I'll get into that in one second. Here's an outline of my project. As I mentioned before, I'm extending an existing model of glioblastoma using two tools, violin and clarinet. The existing model, um, which was developed by someone in our lab, Emily, has 250 interactions. And by interactions, I mean, it'll say, for example, this protein AKT regulates P53, 
And there are 250 of those. They're, not, they're all neatly organized into an Excel spreadsheet. But 250 interactions isn't enough to get a clear picture of how glioblastoma actually operates at the molecular level. So my project is looking at how we can extend this model, interpret it, visualize it, and compare it to other existing glioblastoma models. As well as creating and extending the GBM model, I'm debugging and end user testing both violin and clarinet for Casey and Yasmin, who developed clarinet respectively. And as Casey mentioned, I'm also learning Python because previous to this summer, I only knew R and last summer was actually my first summer doing any sort of coding at all. And it was a pleasure to learn Python. So my overall methodology was as follows. First, I collect machine reading output and these are from 242 PubMed papers. So this goes back to that diagram I showed earlier. I take 242 papers, I put them through what's known as a reading assembler, and that corrects basically every interaction in every one of those papers. For example, this protein phosphorylates this protein, or this one negatively regulates this, and it puts them into an Excel spreadsheet. And I'll show this in more detail, but then once I have this spreadsheet, I run it through violin, and then after interpreting the results from violin, I run it through clarinet, and then I interpret it again. And of course, I'll explain all of this in more detail, but I do it again. And the second time I do it with 454 papers instead of 242 papers. Now, if you think about that, that's a lot of papers. Um, each paper is what, 15 to 20 pages generally, and they're um, research papers. So obviously it would be inefficient to have a human read through these which is why we use what's known as a reading assembler. For a reading assembler, we want to have a set number of queries. And for a query, that could be a protein that we know is already implicated in the formation of glioblastoma. For example, all of these um, proteins and genes and enzymes have been implicated in glioblastoma. So on the left, you'll see the agent and the patient. The agent does the affecting and the patient is the affected. For example, these were the 242 papers I mentioned in the beginning. Those are the queries I used. So I would put these into a database known as REACH, um, isocitrate dehydrogenase, as I mentioned before, how a lot of GPM tumors are classified as my first agent up there. I'd get a list of papers through PMC IDs, which is just the number that refers to the paper. And then I'd have a list of all the papers that refer to these proteins being interacted upon. And then from there, we can sort through all the interactions that appear in these different papers. And on the right, we see the same thing. I just have more terms and they're all different from those on the left. And that was my second pass through. The terms on the left and a few of them on the right were collected from this wonderful glioma model I found from the Kanekisa laboratories. Um, and as you can see, a lot of the terms on the previous slide, P53, EGF, TGF, alpha, they show up in this model as well. So the reading assembler, the initial part of my project, which is figuring out what interactions appear in PubMed papers and extracting them into a readable format, how does it work? So I would sort five to 15 PubMed papers for each of those previous queries I mentioned. So for isocitrate dehydrogenase, for example, that's very highly implicated in GPM. So I'd take closer to 15 of the papers that showed up in REACH. I'd put them into a list. And then the reader actually uses a tool called Indra. And Indra goes through the paper and collects all of this wonderful information. And I wrote a small script so that um, to to read the PMC IDs directly from the document. So instead of having to put each paper through Indra one by one, which obviously is inconvenient for 400 papers, I just put the PMC IDs, the number that refers to the paper into a document and have the script read them automatically, plug them into Indra and output a file. So this creates a list of LEEs or literature extracted events. And here's a small example, as you can see, ATR also mediates the phosphorylation of the tumor suppressor P53. The words themselves don't matter too much, but words like mediates indicate positive regulation, which Indra picks up on. Phosphorylation means a phosphate group is added. And 
ATR and P53 are the two proteins being acted upon. So Indra will put these into a format that says ATR is the regulator, P53 is the regulated, phosphorylation and mediation are how um, P53 is being mediated. And here's just a small look at how the reading assembly actually looks. Obviously, this is the output, so it's not very pretty, but from the first set of output I had with the 242 papers, I got 10,000 literature extract events, which is quite a few, more than I can read, certainly. And from the second reading output, I had 25,000, nearly 26,000. So after collecting all of these literature extracted events, um, basically 26,000 different lines saying that this protein modifies this protein or this protein is modified by this, I put them through violin. And what violin does is it scores each of these interactions. It says, how important is this interaction when you're considering a model of glioblastoma? So to put into violin, I put my reading file, which has the interactions, and I put in the model file, which is the existing glioblastoma model with the 250 interactions. And as I mentioned, violin output scored and categorized interactions. So a brief example, EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor, has nine interactions in the existing model file. So it's already somewhat important because out of the 250 interactions in the GBM model, nine of them are EGFR. And EGFR is either being acted upon or it's doing the acting. And my first reading set, the one with the 10,000 output, that has 900 EGFR interactions. So violin will look at the model file. It'll say, okay, there are nine interactions. It'll look at my first reading set. It'll say there are 900 interactions. And because there are so many interactions of EGFR, violin will categorize EGFR as very important and it'll score it highly. So um, the actual number that violin gave was 2,940, which doesn't mean much out of income. It doesn't mean much out of context, but in the context of the spreadsheet, that violin output, 2,940, was the highest number that violin had scored. Violin also produces extensions, contradictions, corroborations, flagged, and a total output. Each of these is important. Extensions extend a model. Violin says, okay, this is something that doesn't already exist in its exact form in the model, but it would be helpful. Contradictions directly contradict something that's in the model. For example, um, there was one contradiction that showed up that said that PRB, the retinoblastoma protein, negatively regulates itself. And that was contradictory to something else in the model that already said that PRB positively regulated itself. So that shows up as a contradiction. And there are very few of these, as I'll show later. But usually we can go through one by one, see what the issue is, whether it's just terminology from the paper, et cetera. Corroborations are also important. They show how accurate what's in the model already is, actually is, and they confirm the veracity of the model. Flagged had some sort of issue with them. There, should, there are generally very few flagged interactions, but we have to go through these by hand because none of them are the same. And the total output is essentially um, slightly categorized, duplicate removes. It's all of the extensions, contradictions, and corroborations put together. It just doesn't have duplicates. So it's like the original reading output, except it's a little bit cleaner. And here are some examples of how extensions look like. Extensions are what I found to be most important in my project to put through clarinet, which I'll mention why in a second. But as you can see in the right over here, EGFR, this is the total score I mentioned, 2,940. And even from the first 12 extensions, that's by far the highest. It's almost twice as much as the second interaction, which also happens to be EGFR. So this just goes to show how violin scores different interactions based on how many times they appear in your model and in your reading set. So numbers, as for actual numbers, I input my first reading set with 10,000 interactions. I got 6,000 extensions compared to only 6,200 total interactions without duplicates. So that's, that's good. Um, it doesn't mean much just yet, but that's a lot of interactions and extensions. And then for my second reading set, I had 16,700 extensions. Now, if you think back, our initial model only had 250 
interactions. So whether we're adding 6,000 or 16,000 interactions, this model is already um, more than tenfold um, going up in size. So here is a little bit of a graphical result of the violin output. Um, this is for the first reading set. And I'll point out a few things. The first is that the number of extensions in the top left column, uh, panel is significantly higher than the number of corroborations, contradictions, or flagged. That makes sense. Our initial model didn't have very many interactions. So everything would be extending the model. I also want to point out that the maximum value on the y-axis of that same panel is 6,000. That's similar to the number of extensions we had, which was around 6,200, I believe. For our second reading set, I'm going to transition this figure. It looks nearly exactly the same. I'll just go back and forward once more so you can see how they look nearly the same. And this is good. This means our results are consistent between reading sets. And the only thing that changed is that there are now 15,000 interactions versus 6,000 interactions. So once violin gives me this output, I put it through clarinet. And um, I'm sure you can tell how these names were, how these names are so apt to what these tools do. Clarinet clarifies networks, which helps us visualize what the model actually looks like. So again, I'm inputting the original reading file and I'm inputting the model file. I'm also inputting the extensions that Violin gave me rather than the whole thing, because I'm trying to figure out how Violin and Clarinet work together. And then what um, Clarinet outputs is an ECLG or an event collaboration graph, which kind of looks like a keg analysis or a bipartite graph, um, as well as grouped and clustered extensions. So here's an example of the raw ECLG output. For example, this says that the T cell receptor um, acts upon the CD4 receptor, or that FOXP3 acts upon ITK, and the weight is two. That means the importance is two. It ranges from zero to two. And that can be positive or negative regulation. And again, here's some output that just shows what this looks like. And there are many, many rows of this. But what it actually looks like once we take um, the inputs and we put them through clarinet, the first thing we put is the initial reading set. That's just the raw data I get from the reading assembler. And this is what was being done previously. If you want to see how good um, your reading assembly interactions are, you put them through clarinet. You don't put violin through the middle. But what I did was I put the first reading set through violin and then I put it through clarinet. And um, I showed the numbers here. The initial reading set is 10,000 events. The total output from violin, which is everything minus the duplicates, is 6,000 events. And the extensions, which are everything that doesn't appear in the model, is 6,000 events. And the reason why we want to put things through violin before putting them through clarinet is because violin scores these interactions and shows the importance of each interaction before we put it through clarinet. It's basically a filtering step to help refine the model. And then, of course, I did this again with my second reading set, and these numbers are here, 24,000, 17,000, 6,000, 16,000. So the first output of my initial reading set through clarinet looks like this. It's a lot going on in here. There are a ton of interactions. This is 10,000 events. And as you can tell, everything's all clustered um, in a few different places. There are three main clusters. There's the green cluster, which is P53, the tumor suppressor protein. There is the red cluster, which is P10, another tumor suppressor protein that's down here. P53 and P10 are both play an important role in DNA damage response and carcinogenic cell signaling. And they act as tumor suppressors. And then, interestingly, there's an insulin um, cluster, which is in blue over here. And the reason why this is interesting is because we don't know much about how insulin is regulated in glioblastoma. And I'll talk about this more as I move through these figures, but this is how the initial reading output looked. Now we do our first stage of filtering with violin, and already this figure is so much cleaner. There, um, the insulin cluster completely disappeared. The 
P10 cluster completely disappeared and the P53 cluster completely disappeared. So a lot of those, this tells us, might have been duplicates. And we look here, we see an autopocyte and an AKT. AKT is being both positively and negatively regulated. And this is still the total output. This doesn't account for what's already in the model. So we run it again with the extensions. And um, it's even cleaner. And this shows us that the three most important clusters from our initial reading output were autopocyte, um, which is known to activate AKT. AKT itself and TP54, which is another tumor suppressing protein. So we see three clusters and the purpose of this figure is to show how the filtering of violin affects the output of clarinet and how that's more valuable to us when we're extending a model than just putting data straight into clarinet. And then I did this again with my second reading set, which had so many more interactions and you can tell because you can't even see the background of my slide through the clusters. Um, there's the T cell receptor, which is big um, red over here and the blue, we have AKT and then insulin um, somewhere around there. And then we filter it to just the total output. We show ERK and MEK. And then just the extensions, MEK and P38. And what this shows again, is that the initial clusters which showed up, which were TCR, AKT and insulin, aren't actually as important as we might think they are implicated in GBM. It's actually MEK and P38 that seem to be more important. That's why this filtering is so important. So current and next steps. Currently, I'm continuing to interpret the clarinet output. There were so many interactions. Um, it's just impossible to look at the figure and get all of that data at once. So we're trying to figure out other ways to visualize that data and how we can visualize it in the context of the GBM model. For example, insulin plays a large role in GBM, and we suspect that it may play an even larger role than is documented in the literature. Next steps, I hope to continue working in the lab for at least the next few months, um, keep visualizing the model, assess our model compared to other models, and repeat with another reading set. Significance, as I mentioned, is to create a large data of glioblastoma interactions, have knowledge of the regulated and the regulators, in glioblastoma and help our lab refine two tools, violin and clarinet. I'd like to acknowledge Casey Hansen, who introduced me for being a wonderful mentor, Yasmin for helping me with clarinet and my troubleshooting, Emily for providing the initial glioblastoma model, my PI, Dr. Miskov Sivanov, and the entirety of the lab for helping me through presentations and lab reports. The Hillman Academy, especially Dr. Boone and Solomon up with me for four years and supporting and encouraging me for all of that time. Um, I've enjoyed the Hillman Academy every summer I'm here and Pitt and the Doris Duke Foundation have been wonderful in supporting me. My family, especially my younger brother Ryan who presented earlier, thank you to all of you and everyone else who helped me along the way. Now, I went a little bit over, um, I realized, but thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Great job, Neil. So let's give Neil a round of applause. Good work. Any questions for Neil? So Neil, I have a question. Uh, and it might not be what you want to talk about because you say insulin may or may not be important, but that it intrigues me of the insulin's role in GBM, did you happen in, and one of the reasons, so insulin activates both AKT and MEK, right? Which you do pull out as, as being important after your, your violin analysis. Um, did you happen to find, you probably don't know this. this is like one of these questions I always hated whenever I was given a, a talk. You, you uh, basically triggered some of my old research when I studied insulin-like growth factor receptor, which is really important in breast cancer and lots of different cancers in development. Uh, and insulin-like growth factor receptor and insulin do very similar things. Uh, I'm wondering, did you happen to pull out or did IGF-1 or IGF-1 receptor, do you know if they were in your models in addition to insulin or maybe there is you know, there is a high level of overlap between them? Um, but I'm, I'm just curious about the, the roles of uh, insulin and IGF-1 um, in glioblastoma given your, your new models and the fact that AKT and MEK uh, downstream are really important. 
So IGF-1 was definitely one of my initial queries, um, which confounds the results that it would show up a little bit because since I'm querying for it, it'll show up as both a regulator and a regulated. Um, I don't, I didn't look exactly at how insulin regulates IGF-1, but I certainly can. But one thing I did notice, interestingly, is that there is an insulin epitope in the CD4 response, which seems to have been especially upregulated in the GBM data I showed. As well, P10 seemed to negatively regulate insulin as well. So I feel like insulin, um, I feel like the reason insulin seems so heavily implicated in this model is because of insulin resistance in these cancers having to do with overstimulation of the IGF-1 receptors. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Incredibly insightful. Thanks, Neil. Any other questions? If not, I wanna give another big round of applause and thanks to the students in session three and their mentors who all did incredible. Uh, again, this year was so unique. It, it, last year I said it was so unique and it was when we were all virtual, but at least we were small. And because we were so small, I felt like I got to know the students on individual levels and knew what they were doing all the time in their projects. Uh, this year, because we ended up being you know, close to 70 students, I didn't feel like that was the case. So it was incredibly complex. So this is the first time I've seen a lot of these final presentations and all of you blew me away. Uh, you did an absolutely amazing job. Uh, so it, again, that, that speaks to, to, to your incredible hard work and the incredible hard work of your mentors. So one big thank you to all of our students and all of our sessions. You did an amazing job. Uh, congratulations. The last thing that we have is the closing ceremonies. So I'm going to put, and again, you should have received this on your invitation. I'm going to put it in the chat just in case. Uh, we have two different ways of accessing it. So for the students, we ask for all of you to join the Zoom link. Um, but our Zoom only allows, I think, 100 people in. So we yeah. were worried that if there were outside people who wanted to see, we wouldn't have enough space for everyone. So we also have a YouTube link uh, where you can watch uh, the ceremonies, although you're not kind of on camera with us. So that both of those links are now in the chat. They're on hopefully your invitations. Students, please join the Zoom link. Parents, friends, family, everyone else, watch over the shoulder of the student you're with or use the YouTube link uh, to come in and celebrate with us. That closing ceremony will be at two o'clock. Um, for the students who've been here in the past, it will be much shorter than normal. I will, still, I will still spend 20 or 30 minutes saying thank you to the many, many people who allow this program to go on this year. Uh, but the graduation itself will be much quicker. So just to prepare you, and I've sent this out an email, we're gonna ask each section group by group, and this section will be the first one. So you guys will be the, the, the test to see if we can do this properly, is asked everyone in the Cosby and Friends section to turn on their cameras. I'll then read everyone's name, and then we'll give you all a big round of applause and then move on to the other six sessions uh, that took place simultaneously. I'm sure we're the last ones because we're, we're the, the largest of all of the simultaneous Zoom sessions that are happening. So again, congratulations. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all again at two o'clock for our closing ceremonies. So until then, please take a half an hour and relax a bit. Thank you. You're welcome.